America, Pennsylvania, SN District, Plank Street, House 107. December 23, 2021, 7.50 a.m. A blonde man was walking along the corridor. He picked up coffee and offered it to his colleague, asking how work was going. He replied that everything was fine, after which he asked him a question, since he thinks how long should they sit here? Three years have already passed. The guy grinned and asked again, so he thinks that three years is a long time? He has been here since the founding of this company, soon to be eight years. They have only one task. Eight years ago, when the employees were gathered in front of the bald man who is the boss and shouted, they need to tirelessly monitor that guy on the ship. This is not their whim, but an order from the CIA. This is an order from the White House. The man looked at his watch and thought, eight hours, one minute. This company has been holding them for 69, 457 hours, 10 minutes left. The red-haired guy shouted, Commander, something is wrong here. The ship's speed suddenly increased. He became wary and looked at the screen, where there was a warning about the danger, because of which he got scared and dropped the coffee right on the floor and everything spilled. He immediately grabbed the phone and called the commander, informing him of the problem. He asked again, what is it? The guy shouted, code red. Meanwhile, in the CIA and the White House, the men participating in this process were very surprised. South Pacific, Lawn Hill, morning 11.30 a.m. The long ships approached the rocks. A lot of military people surrounded the two guys, one of whom was telling the other that he should not break the protocol and return to a safe place. The White House and the CIA are very unhappy with this behavior. A guy with an unusual hairstyle lit a cigarette and asked with a smile on his face to tell everyone dissatisfied to leave him alone. Now he needs to talk to their boss. This is an order. The man got angry and shouted something to him out of anger, clenched his teeth and handed the phone into his hands. The guy with an incredible smile on his face greeted the president and asked him not to be angry, saying that everything was fine. He knows that every agreement has its own expiration date and over these eight years he has done enough for America. So now he just wants to go to his native land and light a cigarette. Now there is no need to avoid this topic. They all know about his condition health and the drugs he was taking. And he is sure that their doctors have long noticed that his illness is progressing, right? He proposes to make a final deal. Those 16 nuclear warheads that were stolen will be deactivated in three months, and he has very simple conditions. For three months they will not touch it, and they will lie low and completely disappear from this world. These are his last demands, and if he accepts them, then everything will be fine. But if not, then he abruptly stopped his words and made the sound of an explosion, throwing the cigarette butt aside. After which he asked the question threateningly, doesn't a nuclear explosion sound exciting? Now he has only one question, does he agree or not? The president. Suddenly there were loud noises behind him. He handed the phone back to the blonde man and told him to look at it, because the president agreed he should close the champagne. The guy told him in response that he definitely had to go to the underworld. The main character asked him again, did he seem offended? The man menacingly answered him that he, the CIA and the best specialists, they had been serving him for eight years. Here he is Lucifer. The hero started screaming Lucifer. What a stupid nickname this is. Did they really rely on the traditions of his country? Still, he likes it better when people call him Yan Luo, which means Lord of Hell. The man asked again Yan Luo. Okay, now he has nowhere to run. He sat down on a stone, and with a grin, rolling another cigarette in his hand, asked him, does he think that a person like him can be caught by him? Even the White House understood everything, but it hasn't reached it yet. Cancer cells have already spread throughout his brain, and the tumor is growing more and more every second. If he was still fit, he would be stuffed with drugs. He lit a cigarette with a lighter and said that he had five, four left. When he started counting down, the man started shouting that they should disperse and be careful. He definitely had some bad thought, because this freak is not that easy. Law slammed the lighter shut and finished zero. Hell, here he comes. Meanwhile, in London, a man in a suit, surrounded by many security guards, was talking to someone on the phone and shouting that he needed to report to the foundation that these bloodsuckers don't care whether it's dangerous or not. Billions in profit is what they need. Suddenly the man was hit in the head by a bullet that went through it, and he ended the phone call. A large group of people was targeted, and a girl with long black hair standing on the roof said that the target had been eliminated, reported Firefly. This was the girl's code name. A minute later she sank to the ground and walked through the streets of the city. Taking the phone in her hands, she said that this toy was really not bad, but the shooting speed was not enough. 
She opened the door of the red car and said that next time she should take this into account, Fox. When she got behind the wheel, she agreed that if she had to do this kind of work, then they shouldn't call her anymore. She was forced to overwork, and this is quite boring. She was informed via phone that there would be no more work, and now they were all going into sleep mode. Firefly was surprised by this expression and asked again, how long will this last? She was told that it would last forever. She became alert and began to shout angrily, who gave such an order? She's gonna call her boss now. Fox replied that he did just that. An hour ago, he recorded a voice message in the chat. Firefly began to furiously shout at her that it was all a lie. She should have died already and was lying as usual. If she lies again, she will die. Fox said, they have been working together for so long. She knows him. Firefly's whole body shook and after some silence she asked, did he really leave them like that? Tears appeared in her eyes and Fox replied that his last words were that he hoped that they would all go to heaven, but his only path was to hell. Okay, Firefly, she should follow orders. This is their last conversation, so they will see each other in the next life. After these words, she hung up, and Firefly was left sitting in the car in a state of shock. She looked at the phone screen again, after which she got out of the car with a weapon in her hand, and abruptly began shooting in an unknown direction over the heads of unknown people passing by. Having started such a firefight, all movement stopped and people began to run away in different directions from fear. A drop of tears fell from her face. She looked into the distance and asked again, Underworld. She would also like to know how it is there. Suddenly she took out her sword, one of her eyes filled with red paint, and she stuck it into herself. Her blood splashed, and at that moment a notification appeared on her phone in the chat of Yan Luo and his devils that she was now offline. Meanwhile in South America. A passenger plane was flying over the mountains. A blonde girl who was sitting inside the plane near the window with a glass of wine in her hand was talking on the phone and answering someone that she understood everything. Her code name is Hummingbird. Under her legs and seat, there was a guy who was bandaged and could not move. He tried to moan, but his mouth was taped shut. The hummingbird lowered her gaze and asked again, does this mean the underworld? She always wanted to see it. Suddenly the plane exploded and a fiery flame spread through the air. It has been reported that hummingbirds, blueberries, and irises have gone offline. An unknown girl sat near the computer and clenched her fists until they bled from anger. She paused, reached into the desk drawer, took out a firearm, put bullets in there, and leaned it against her head. She reported Fox left the network. She closed her eyes and moments later a loud sound occurred. One day there was a lesson in one of the educational institutions. The teacher explained the topic to his students and said, Chen Nuo, he invites him to try to do this. In this office, among the students, there was Lo, who looked around in surprise and wondered what was happening. It was December 23, 2000, 11.45 a.m., Group 6. He sat at one of the pairs with an open notebook, and all the students turned to him in surprise. He stared at the equation that was written on the board and realized that it was great, because he didn't understand anything. Drops of sweat dripped from his face from shame. He covered his face with his hand and said, This is truly hell. After that, he grinned and wondered if this place reminded him of something. Was he really back in his youth? On the territory of the educational institution, there was a sports complex and a playground where children practiced and played basketball. One of the guys threw a basketball into the hoop, and the surrounding girls were embarrassed by what was happening. One of them even shouted for that guy to act further. Law grinned and remembered the words of the teacher, who kicked him out of the office and shouted at him to go and think about his behavior. It turned out to be too strange for him. He stopped not far from the girls when he went outside and looked into the distance. After a while, he turned his attention to mathematics textbooks and other school supplies, reflecting on the fact that he suddenly found himself in a new environment with only strangers around. He raised his gaze to the sky, looked at the bright rays of the sun through his fingers, with which he tried to cover the bright light falling into his eyes, and said, So it turns out that the Lord considers this a punishment. Maybe this is a reward after all. Suddenly someone screamed, someone has to save her. The school's first beauty jumped off the roof. Law stood in disbelief and looked at the falling girl, who screamed loudly. He made a sharp movement and extended his hand to her. He was already very close, and a moment later there was a bang. He caught her, pressing her to his body. When she was on top of him, she looked at him with embarrassment and grabbed him by the shoulders. This girl's name is Sun Keek. Those around them looked at them in surprise, and a moment later, they found themselves in the director's office. They looked at each other with deep eyes and were silent. 
Law turned back and thought, it's good that she fell from the second floor, because if it was on the floor above, then she would definitely die. At that moment, the director burst into the office, sharply opening the doors, and cleared his throat, scaring the guys. This director's name is Song Shingli, and he asked a question, have they already been to the school doctor? Everything is fine. Law replied with a smile on his face that everything was fine, and he was very conveniently there, so she successfully fell on him, and he could probably be considered the savior. The director turned to Cake and asked her again, did she jump from the roof? How did this come to her mind? She tried to say in a trembling voice that she was looking at the landscapes and accidentally fell. Dead. She didn't jump. Law was very surprised that she was the director's daughter, because you couldn't tell that from her appearance. Shingli addressed him by the name Chen Nuo and said that no matter how or what happened, he was very grateful to him in any case. He will be released from classes. Has he already been to the hospital? Does anyone need to call one of his caregivers? He waved his hand and said that everything was really good and he didn't have a single scratch. He will rest and feel good. Shanley replied, that's good, but if something hurts somewhere, he can ask for time off at any time. He silently reached out with his hand to the doorknob, suddenly turned around and told the director that there was something. Shanley asked him to talk about it. Guo asked with a smile, could he borrow 50 yuan? His head hurts pretty bad. After some time, he arrived at the address on a piece of paper on which his details were written. He approached the destroyed house, stopped near the stairs, looked around and continued on his way. When he entered the corridor, he carefully examined the stickers on the walls and wooden doors and said that there was an air of antiquity here. When he opened the door and entered the room, he saw all the necessary furniture, an old TV, and a frame with photographs. He looked at everything in his room, pulled out many notebooks and began to think. This is what he found out about the guy he was reincarnated into. He is 18 years old and is an ordinary schoolboy. His parents divorced early and he saw the whole tragedy of their lives. Six years ago, my mother remarried to a new man and left him and a couple of yuan to my grandmother. Three years ago, because of her new husband's gambling, her mother fell into debt and the two lived like in prison. Last year, my grandmother died and the young guy was left alone with himself but tried to hold on he was an outcast at school. He smiled and said that it was pretty good. He had essentially no social connections with anyone, and this would save him from a lot of problems. He paid attention to the calendar hanging on the wall and was very surprised by such numbers. After all, when he noticed that it was the 25th on the calendar, something alerted him. After some time, it got dark outside, he sat at his computer and asked a question in a search engine about how he could get to Seoul in 15 days. It seemed difficult to him, and he understood that 15 days would not be enough. He smoked a cigarette and continued to remember that in 15 days at 12 p.m., this girl would experience the most terrible tragedy of her life. He must save her, but he has no money to buy a ticket and no passport and nothing at all. Of course, there is no way for a simple guy to get there. A bright moon shone in the sky. He sat down on the sofa and magical sparks appeared around his body, as well as in his eyes. Not a drop was touched in the glass of water. He sank onto the back of the sofa and fell asleep. Meanwhile, Cake, who was in her house, listened to music through headphones in which she sang, Love requires courage and you need to tell him everything. She remembered how she saw him while she was on the second floor and stared, which made her very embarrassed, leaned on the railing and accidentally fell. When she remembered everything that was happening, she said with an incredible feeling of shame, but why him? She's so ashamed. Suddenly she noticed what was in front of her. It was an open love letter for her from Chen Nuo. He was reborn as a guy with the same name as him and returned to the past. What is the real him doing at this moment? He went to a telephone booth and dialed a number, but was informed that he had received the wrong phone number. He knocked on the door, thinking about how he lived here as a child. A plump man with a pack of chips in his hands opened the door and asked him in a friendly manner who he was looking for here. Nuo frowned when he saw him and left there, thinking that his phone number was not working and the house where he lived was not his house. He approached the saleswoman, said hello, and asked for a pack of cigarettes, handing her money. When he examined her, he thought that everything seemed to be the same here as before and the saleswoman had not changed. Even that fat guy who humiliated him had not changed. But the only question is, where is he himself in this world? It can't be, everything is as before, only he has disappeared. Really? He suddenly raised his finger and started screaming in anger, Author, let him come here. 
Did he decide that he was so ordinary and that his story could not be written down? At that moment, something began to fly from the sky in his direction. It was an object similar to a pencil, but quite large in size, which stuck into the ground and began to bend in different directions. This object had hands and low frowned, watching this, when suddenly a pencil with a human face asked him not to worry and said that in the future they would explain everything to him and tell him about the intricacies of his life, he should follow the story. The next day, those around the school began to discuss among themselves that Chen Nuo wrote a love letter to Sun Keek. Cake, passing by them, heard all these rumors. They paid attention to her and pointed their fingers, saying that Chen Nuo is really a role model and is not even afraid that the director will break his legs. She was greatly embarrassed by these words. She stopped, completely flushed with shame, when she was about to enter the office. Nuo was sitting at his desk and writing something. He was writing down a name on paper, Lai Yin Wan. She entered the office, came closer to him, and asked if he had a free minute. He stood up and asked again with a serious expression on his face, does she want to talk about something important? She became embarrassed and said that he had recently given her a letter of confession and that she was very sorry, but she could not accept it. He looked away and thought that the guy had made a mistake and hit on the director's daughter. She got angry and said that she was actually talking to him and said that she did not accept it. He replied, okay, and she asked him not to write anything like that again. She is still a schoolgirl and the main thing for them now is studying. He replied that everything was correct, after which he asked again, how many points did she have for the entrance exams? She answered in disbelief, 196. He stood up and said, in that case, she really should learn the material. As far as he remembers, many achieve a passing score. After these words, he walked past her and wished her success in her studies, touching her shoulder. Her heart sank inside, and she wondered why she felt like she had just been rejected. After some time, the teacher announced a small announcement. Next month on the 10th, the Olympiad is planned to be organized in the Korean Yanbin Autonomous Prefecture, and if anyone wants, they can register right now. They can find out more information in the announcement at the stand. A guardian's signature is required for registration and money for the trip. Nuo thought Yangbin, then in the bark, and from there to Seoul. This suits him. He raised his hand and asked the teacher if everyone could sign up. The teacher looked at him in surprise and asked again, is he? Does he want to participate in the math Olympiad? He asked if there were any other Olympiads. His classmates started laughing, and the teacher asked him to look at it himself at the stand. And now they are starting classes, they should open page 46. After a while, the bright rays of the sun were visible through the falling green foliage. Nuo fell asleep right on his desk during recess, while his classmates were talking with each other in the office. He yawned deeply, scratched the back of his head, and said that it was quite boring here. One of the guys with glasses came up to him and asked if he wanted to go play slot machines with them. He replied that he had just gotten enough sleep and could move around. When they arrived at the gaming center, the surrounding guys were surprised at their game, and Nuo looked at the computer with a grin, after which he said that it was not interesting and he would not play anymore. Someone grabbed him by the shoulder. Nuo became wary, turned around, and saw a menacing man behind him, who asked him, Is this freak by any chance Chen Mo? They should go outside and discuss something. The guys went out into the street and stopped in a narrow alley between the houses. The man released everyone present and said that they could now go. The guys walked away from him, and Nuo confidently asked, Are there any problems? The man approached his friend to light a cigarette and said that his name was Zio Dao, but he could just call him Dao. They say that he wrote a love letter to Sun Keek. Boy, did he really decide to meet his girl. In Chen Nuo's imagination, he imagined the chav and the first beauty of the school as a comedy, which made him ask him the question, is she his girlfriend? He pulled a knife out of his pocket and said, now this is not so, but she will be his, but for now he knows what will happen. He suddenly started screaming, calling him names that he was talking to him, and he had to answer quickly. Nuo smiled and replied that he knew everything, after which he clenched his hands into a fist and said, Here is such a deserted place that is perfect for this. When he stretched his hands, they crunched strongly, and a fire appeared in his eyes from emotions before the upcoming event. Meanwhile, Kate carried the container in her hand and recalled how her mother asked her to take dinner to her father, who was late at work, since it was already 8 o'clock in the evening. She was approaching the school and suddenly saw Nuo sitting behind the bicycles, watching someone. She looked at him in surprise and wondered what he was doing. 
He tried to insert the existing key into a suitable lock, saying that this also did not suit him. She came closer and asked why he removes locks from other people's bicycles. He turned to her and after some silence said, if he says that he forgot which one belongs to him, will she believe him? She answered menacingly, you're welcome. After that, she walked past him with a sad look and he asked her to wait, asking if he could ask her something. She asked with embarrassment, what? He began to say something, and she thought that it didn't matter what exactly he said, in any case she should behave calmly and not show any emotions. He said that he thought she might be gentler with him. These words surprised her, and he continued to say that he of course understands that she is the director's daughter and should be exemplary, she cannot hang around strange guys and communicate with ordinary boys, but could she at least not be so hostile and cold towards him? She became embarrassed and asked if he wanted too much. He replied that she was not bad, and he understood that she simply did not have enough experience to correctly resolve this situation, and therefore she simply refused. This is quite childish behavior, and when she grows up, she will begin to understand what he is talking about. She watched his speech in surprise, and he asked again, after all, he saved her life. Did she not forget about it? She looked away and replied that the second floor was not so high, and she would not have died. He said with a grin, she didn't die but you can still say that he helped her, right? Even if it's an accident. She agreed with him, unable to refute these words, and he asked her if she knew Qing Dao. She replied that she knew. He was guarding her at the school, and once dad drove him away, but then he came again. Nuo smiled and asked her not to worry and said that he would not bother her any time soon. She was surprised and shouted to him, what did he say? He replied that he said that for now he would not cause her unnecessary trouble, because multiple fractures take a long time to heal. Dao, meanwhile, was in the hospital, sneezing. His entire body was bandaged with various casts and supports. He just got to the hospital and is already sick. Nuo agreed that he did not need thanks. He did it for his own benefit. She heard about the event in Yanbin. Keek answered yes, but why is he asking? He continued to look for a suitable lock, and she shouted at him not to break anything pointing with her finger that the bicycle was there. It was a black bicycle with a rusty basket and only one working horn. He looked towards that bicycle and asked her how she knew this. They don't even study in the same group, she said in a trembling voice that she simply knew about it. Nuo smiled even stronger and asked again with a sly expression on his face, does she just know? She scratched the back of her head and asked again, changing the topic of conversation, so why did she ask about that event? He got up, walked towards his bike and said that he wanted to sign up there, but looked at the requirements and realized that he couldn't get through. Keek asked him a question in surprise, so he wants to go with the group to Yanbun. He turned around and replied that he just wanted to look at the snow, and her dad was the director. He was sure that she knew how to help him. Cake looked at him thoughtfully and wondered, should I look at the snow? It sounds kind of mature, but he's probably just joking. She pursed her lips a little and Nuo thought with embarrassment that this girl doesn't even realize that such actions are a knife to the heart of guys and it's dangerous to behave like that. Suddenly a twisted smile appeared on his face. He turned away from her and she asked if he had had dinner yet. He replied, yes, he has no money. Cake asked what was going on with him. He doesn't look like himself. She knows it's hard for him, but not as much. But if he needs help, he can talk to her father and he will issue him quotas. She didn't want to insult him, it's just that Nuo suddenly interrupted her words and asked, she seems to know a lot about him than she asked for information. Cake became embarrassed and asked him again, what did he say? She just heard rumors. He paused, then noticed the container in her hands and asked, is there anything tasty here? She clutched the container in her hands and said that this was dinner for dad. He smiled and after a while, when it was already completely dark outside, he sat down on his bicycle and took a bite of a chicken leg saying that it was very tasty. He drove towards the house while Shanley was in the office at the table asking his daughter why there weren't enough chicken legs today. Where did the second one go? She didn't know what to answer him and stood silently behind him. Nuo, who happened to be at home, began training on the floor, doing push-ups with one arm. He thought that he had to get in good shape, he had a long way to go, and to get to the right place, he now needed to work hard on himself. His strength training caused objects in the apartment to shake, like the water in the glass. The next day, he entered the classroom and paused to think that Teacher Liu does not work at the school and he is one of the employees of the classroom. 
He is confident that the company that sent him and is organizing this trip now has sponsors for educational institutions, and therefore he is confident that Teacher Liu is able to help him implement the plan. He walked up to the director's office, who asked him if he had any questions. Nuo replied, Yes, unfortunately, he did not have time to enroll in the group for the trip to Yanlin, but he heard that there is a quota for some students. Teacher Liu replied that quotas are given only to students who have stood out in some way. To obtain this, you need a signature and recommendations from the director. Nuo handed him the envelope and Teacher Liu looked at it in fear and asked again, What is this? When he took the envelope, he pulled out a gold card and said that he almost forgot that there were three empty places for volunteers. He knows what volunteers do, right? They travel with the group, eat and live with them, but must run some errands. Nuo replied that it was not a problem if he could go with them. The teacher asked him to prepare his personal data and identification number, but before he could finish speaking, Nuo handed him all the documents. He smiled and said, Okay, then he can go. The list of students for the trip will be announced on the notice board this afternoon. He looked after him and thought that this guy was not at all simple. After school, Cake walked down the street alone and remembered that she got a very low result on the test. She clenched her fist and said that next time she would definitely not fail the test. No matter what, she must not lag behind the others. She completely lost motivation because the average score was 60 points and she received 45. People around her were discussing that there was a list of those going on the trip. Many were happy that their name was there. Someone could finally visit the Yangbin. She remembered Nuo saying that he wanted to go there and see the snow. When she approached the notice board, she saw his name and said in surprise that he would actually be able to go there and look at the snow. She brought the school corridors and burst into her father's office, opening the doors and shouted, Dad, she wants to go to the Yanbin Olympics. He replied that he thought she was not interested. Why did she suddenly change her mind? She said in a trembling voice that she just wanted to look at the snow. He said that all the places were already taken. She began to beg him that she didn't care about it and wanted to go with the school choir. He was surprised and asked again, hadn't she said before that she hated singing in the choir and the like? What happened to her? She replied that she likes it now. January 3, platform of Jinling Railway Station. She found herself with a suitcase in her hand near the train and looked around after which she heard a teacher who was shouting to volunteer to help the students carry their luggage onto the train. Cake raised her hand and Nuo noticed her and went to her suitcase, but he did not do it alone, as Shenli approached her, who said that he would do it. Nuo grinned and said, so he is here too. After some time, he asked Cake a question, so she could also join the trip. He didn't see her name in the ad, so what is she going to do on Yangbin? She replied that how she got here should not concern him, she also wants to see snow. Shanley noticed their sweet conversation through the window and wondered why this guy was so close to his daughter. He wished he were leading this trip. The train set off and Nuo found himself in his carriage, reading a book on his bed. The teacher addressed him and asked him to get something to drink and pack his luggage in the hallway. Also, he should be careful with his camera in his bag as he might drop it. Nuo continued to sit silently, buried in a book. The teacher was silent for some time, after which he addressed him again and said that these words were addressed to him. He closed the book and said, Sir, he is here to travel, not to work as a laborer. Maybe he made a mistake somewhere. The teacher got very angry and told him that he was a volunteer and had to carry out all sorts of assignments. Nuo said that he paid him for this excursion, and if he is not satisfied, then why not provide him with a receipt? Why doesn't he talk to their guide and ask him to let him off at the next stop, and he'll go back to school on his own? The teacher told him that he was such a difficult child. Nuo offered him a pack of cigarettes and asked him not to be such an angry person, offering him one cigarette. He grinned and took it from the pack and lit a cigarette, when suddenly his face was twisted in horror, and he wondered how he dared to deceive him. This is not a cigarette. What a freak he is. Nuo hummed the melody with a satisfied expression on his face. Yanbin Station the train arrived at the station, Kate came out with a suitcase in her hands and angrily wondered what was wrong with her. She only went on this trip because of this idiot. Nuo suddenly snatched her suitcase and threw the soda into her hands, saying that she could drink it. She looked after him with her mouth open and how carefully he carried her suitcase. They walked along the station together, and after a while they all settled down in their places. Teacher Liu started yelling at Nuo, what is he saying? Is he leaving the group? They should actually be here for four more days. There is no way he will do this, and he should not even think about it. If something happens to him, 
it will be his fault. Does he want to be killed? Nuo picked up the phone and started typing something, after which he turned on the voice recorder and Teacher Liu's face changed greatly when he heard him say that he had given him a fee for the excursion, and if he was not satisfied, then why not give him receipt? Why doesn't he talk to their guide and ask them to let him off at the next stop and return to school on his own? He is such a difficult child. All these words were recorded on a tape recorder, and the teacher angrily shouted at him that he was just mocking him. Does he advise not to play with fire, or does he think that he can do whatever he wants and nothing will happen to him for it? He grabbed him by the clothes and kept screaming that he wasn't scared at all. He may believe it or not, but right now he will report to be kicked out of the group. Nuo with a smile on his face remained silent at his statements, and he continued to shout with a furious face that he should not be so careless because it would be bad for both of them if he showed it. After that, he walked some distances and shouted, Chen Nuo, it was not easy for him to get this job, so he should not do something that could cause him to get hurt. Here, he will give him 200 yuan for the festivities and whatever he wants. His wallet ended up in Nuo's hands, and Liu kept asking him, does he understand how strong he is? He could have tried harder to convince him. Nuo took a deep breath, and after a while, the teacher found himself on the floor under his foot and shouting that he was very mistaken and asks him to put him down, please. Nuo sat down closer to him and said, Sir, why should he worry so much? He came to discuss what he wanted to say and just wanted him to know that he was leaving the group, and as for the cover-up, he believes that he can handle it because there are always more solutions than difficulties. And now he leaves and counts on him, wishing him good luck. Liu extended his hand towards him with tears in his eyes, and 36 hours later, the border between South and North Korea shone with a magical light. Nuo was sitting nearby in the bushes and said that beyond this border, there was already South Korea. Late night, minus 13 degrees. He lay in the snow behind one of the stones and watched what was happening, thinking that he needed to move on the right side. He made a sudden movement and jumped to the other side, while the rays of light were directed in a different direction. He made many more jumps and found himself closer to the boundary, wondering if he could get to the base. Suddenly someone's legs appeared in front of his face. He looked up and saw an angry guy in a military uniform. He started screaming at him, Is he an intruder? After which he grabbed his pocket, but before he could react, Nuo elbowed him right in the neck, causing him to begin to fall and roll his eyes. Nuo caught him, covered his mouth, and dragged him some distance further. The rest of the military guys stood on a hill and looked around the area thoughtfully. One of them asked the other a question, Did something happen? The guy answered him, he had just heard strange sounds, and it seemed to him that someone had broken through the protection. The guy with purple hair told him that he was sure it was just a bird, and he shouldn't worry so much, because they also had patrolmen below. The guy replied that he was probably right. Meanwhile, Nuo was already under their structure, tearing the protective wire with pliers, thinking that this untrained body was still too weak. He continued to crawl gradually and took a bite of the chocolate bar, thinking that he needed to fuel up on calories and prepare to go through the minefield. For others, this minefield is full of dangers, but for him, it is the easiest to pass through the defense line, and he has carried out missions here many times in his past life and has long been familiar with this place. He continued to crawl through the snow and said with a grin that there were still 30 meters left before leaving the minefield. Suddenly something crunched under his knee and he thought that it was terrible because he had lost his balance. He stepped on an anti-personnel mine M2, weighing about 28 kilograms. The explosion is not dense, the fuse chamber is metal, the mine's rebound height is 2 meters, the effective destruction range is 10 meters. If he immediately cleans up his knee, the shell of the mine will rupture, so he needs to be careful, otherwise he may hurt himself and blow everything into small pieces. He remembered all the details of the mine and, imagining a huge bright flame in front of him, thought that first he would cut off a small piece of fabric from the inside of the school uniform to leave the mine under pressure. He did everything as planned and placed the fabric on the mine with care, after which he grabbed a pin from his jacket and said that everything was fine and he would attach it with this. After which he stood up and said that next he needed to take a lead and a pencil. He pulled the lead out of his pencil and thought that he just needed to stay calm. He looked at it and realized everything was ready, after which he began to insert the stylus into the fuse. Thus, in the assembly hall, the schoolchildren lined up and began singing the song. The presenter said that the choir under the name of the same song would perform next. Keek, who was among these guys, sadly thought that Chen Nuo was a fool. 
She tried to see him among the spectators, but he was nowhere to be found, and she thought that she had not seen him for two days. Meanwhile, there was a click under his knee. He exhaled and said that this should be enough, because he replaced the pin with a pencil lead, as well as a pressure pocket made from a piece of school uniform fabric. Double protection, God won't play with him. He looked at the sky and thought, God, he brought him back to this time, and he won't die so early, will he? He frowned and quickly jumped away from the mine. Nothing exploded. He tried to get up from his seat, scratched the back of his head and said, There must also be M2 mines on the southern border. He tested and decided to note this, after which he saw a hole in front of him and jumped into it, thinking that he had finally found a safe place, but after him two more military guys arrived in the pit, who found themselves right in front of him and looked at him in shock, starting to shout that he was there. Nuo rushed to run straight at them, pushing away one of the opponents, who fell to the ground and ran further with confidence in his abilities at the next guy, in whose face he pointed a sharp dagger. The soldier was dumbfounded and looked in horror at the approaching tip. The silhouette of Chen Nuo is reflected in the soldier's eyes. The dagger flies right to his face and he falls to the ground dead. Nuo turns around and sees another military man and says, There is one more left. The man furiously screams at him to attack. But he, holding a mechanical pencil in his hand and clenching his teeth, shouts at him so that he does not pretend to be strong and does not bother him. Then with a quick movement, he attacks the soldier and he stops. A stream of blood flows from the corner of his mouth and a pencil sticks out of his neck. Chen Nuo, looking at how he falls, finally tells him to be a real man and not arrogant. Having changed into a military uniform and straightening his sleeve, he says, with this disguise and a little caution, he will be able to get past the South Korean border guards. After that, he goes along the ditch, leaving the soldiers lying on the ground. On January 6, 2001, at 3 p.m., Nuo was standing in regular clothes in front of a supermarket. During this time, he managed to lighten his hair and is now catching a taxi. Getting into the car, he fastens his seat belt and briefly says, Abgujong. It is one of the areas in South Korea. Afterwards, he relaxes and, closing his eyes, remembers his past life when he received one task. On a small piece of paper, it was written that he was to kill Ha Jun Yi, a business tycoon from N, with a reward of $50 million. Late in the evening, Chen Nuo arrives at Zhang Ji's villa, which is well guarded. It was on this mission that he first met Li Yingguang, who was then 22 years old. Having dealt with the guards, he pushes the large doors and enters the room. Inside was Nguan, who was armed. Nuo was also 22 years old at the time. He looks forward, frozen, and she, holding the gun over the man's face, turns around and asks, Is he a security guard? He's already late. He immediately rushes forward, but a shot is heard. The guards, hearing this, understand that things are bad. Their boss is in danger. Chen Nuo grabs Lai Yingwang and runs out of the room. She shouts irritably that he is a freak. He must let her go. Once in the corridor, he meets guards who, pointing a gun at him, shout at him to stop. Two armed men also approach him from behind. Nuo opens fire and attacks the guards ahead of him. The man behind shouts that they must shoot. Chen Nuo turns around, avoiding the bullets and shoots back. Three shots are heard. After some time, a light is on in a small house in the middle of the forest. Inguan falls to the wooden floor. Nuo, towering over her, explains that this is his safe place. No one can find them here. At that time, she was a madwoman with severe mental paranoia. Inguan asks, looking at him slyly, really. Does that mean he can do whatever he wants with her? Chen Nuo looks down suspiciously. She extends her hand to him, but her gaze suddenly changes and Li Inguan reaches for his leg. He also reacts quickly to her and with one precise blow to the neck puts her to sleep. When Inguan opens his eyes, he finds that she is tied and suspended at the level of the second floor window. Nuo lights the cigar and asks her to be quiet. The next day, untying her, he asks, has she calmed down yet? Does she really want to die that bad? Li Guang, lying on the floor, pauses and asks why he saved her. Because she's beautiful. Or because he's trying to please her. But Chen Nuo, putting a gun to her throat, says, she looks like a little girl who was consumed by anger and hatred while she was reckless, furious, and rude. Inguan suddenly opens his eyes wide and, approaching his face, asks if he is not strong and very smart. Last night, she saw him kill several people and carry her away. Nuo is quite clear, there are not many people in the world who can compare with him. 
She immediately sits down on her knees and bows and says, in this case, she really asks him to help her kill several people. She will do anything to get revenge if she can. She is ready to do anything for revenge. After Lian Guang adds with tears in his eyes, she begs him. At this moment, she remembers her family. This is how Nguan began to undergo his training over the next two years. Chen Nuo trained her in fighting, gun shooting, and marksmanship. After two years, she was able to achieve her goal. One rainy day, she notices the right person in the crowd and shoots at him and kills him. Screams of horror can be heard on the street, someone has been killed. Then, on an empty street, Li Guang falls onto the sidewalk and, gritting his teeth, begins to cry loudly. Unfolding the crumpled photo, she realizes how much she misses her mom, dad, and brother. Suddenly, an umbrella appears above her head, held by Chen Nuo. Then he found out what happened to her on the evening of January 6, 2001. Inguan opens her eyes and sees Nuo, who tells her to wake up. It was the first time he had seen someone cry in their sleep. She looks at him, but when he leaves, she reaches out and grabs his sleeve and asks if he can sit next to her and watch her sleep. She's afraid that if she doesn't see him when she wakes up in the middle of the night, she'll take the gun and shoot herself. Chen Nuo hums thoughtfully, but she asks if she told him about her past. She remembers it was dark, windy, and cold that evening. Mom scolded my brother for fighting at school again, and then they burst in. They killed her father and took all the assets of the business. They killed her brother in front of her and her mother. Her brother loved and looked after her since childhood. They then brutally dealt with her mother, stabbing her to death and nailing her to the floor. And then the guy who stabbed her mom dragged her into the house and abused her next to the sunflowers that her mom planted for her. Nuo, after listening to her, asked why they didn't kill her. Li Guang explained that they wanted to lock her up, perhaps because they thought she was beautiful. They returned for her, but she managed to escape by jumping into the river. Does he clarify what happened next? Ying Van, crossing her arms and looking down sadly, said that after escaping, she found a friend of her father who took her in. But then he also began to abuse her that same night and handed her over to the killers. Chen Nuo repeats what happened next. She replied that while the man was talking on the phone, she poked him in the eye with a stick. He repeats once again, what next? But Nguan sharply told him not to ask her what happened next. Before meeting him, she lived in hell from 16 to 22 years old. She will live for him only because he allowed her to. She will die if he orders her to do this. She will unquestioningly carry out all his orders. She will kill anyone if only he asks her to do so. For a very long time, her world had been completely dark, and the only light she had encountered lately was from him. Nuo doesn't agree with her. No, there is light in everything, so she shouldn't let the darkness overcome her. Everyone can shine on their own, even if a person is weak. No one should place their own hope in the light of others. So she must learn to shine her own light. From today, he calls her Firefly. The voice of a taxi driver is heard, announcing that they have arrived. Chen Nuo wakes up and opens his eyes and gets out of the car. Standing nearby in a school uniform with chewing gum in her mouth and a lollipop in her hand is young Li Guang. Opposite her stands a man who sharply slaps her in the face. She annoyedly shouts at him that he is an idiot. Suddenly Nuo grabs her hand and explains that a girl like her shouldn't use swear words. But she screams in bewilderment, who is he anyway? Then she breaks out of his hands. Chen Nuo adjusts his cap and says with a smile, he is glad to meet Firefly. Inguan asks in surprise, Firefly, who is he? What is he doing here? He puts the hood of her hoodie on her and explains that he is a man who fell from the sky. He came to help her get rid of her nightmares. She first looks at him with large expressive eyes, but then grins and sharply hits him with her knee. Nuo takes a step back and Li Guang runs away screaming that she's being chased by a madman. She needs the police. A policeman immediately approaches her. She says something to him, pointing to her butt. But when they look in this direction together, they see that there is no one there. Ingvan says in bewilderment, he disappeared. On January 6, 2001 at 6 p.m. at the National Intelligence Agency, a man laying out photographs on the table said that this was a secret military operation that they had carried out on the border the previous night but two people who were sent on the mission died. Everything they could find is in these photos. In addition, in the area of their minefield, 300 meters north of the victim, an M2 mine was discovered, which was neutralized using special equipment. Information, photograph, as well as preliminary analysis files were sent to each of those present. This is an incident of military infiltration into their country. The enemy in the north has already pointed their guns at them. 
To protect Korea, an order was issued to find North Korean agents who infiltrated their lands during the shortest construction period. They must serve faithfully. At the same time, there is a secret border command north of the border. A man in uniform and with gray hair announced, the enemy from the south has already entered. From now on, he declares martial law. It is necessary to conduct a search in the camp throughout the entire territory. They must find the enemy who sneaked in here secretly. Their plot must not be allowed to succeed. Who was patrolling the scene that night? One of those sitting at the table said sadly they were shot. It was a dark, cold night. Chen Nuo, sitting on the roof of the house, sneezes and scratches his nose, mentally noting that someone is thinking about him. Afterwards, he takes a bite of a chocolate bar and, closing his eyes, says he forgot to buy something to drink, but it's very tasty. The aroma reaches him, and he wonders if this is chicken soup. Nuo hangs from the roof and looks out the window. The woman sternly says why they fought again at school. The teenager, sitting on his knees in front of her, apologizes. Looking to the side, he gets angry when he sees Li Guang sticking his tongue out at him and laughing. Chen Duo looks at this with emotion through the window. Suddenly a black car slows down nearby, and he hears it. Many people in formal suits get out of the car. They open the gate and go inside. He understands it all started. Unknown persons, led by a gray-haired man, approach the front door. There is a knock on the door. Teacher Lee approaches the door, shouting at the same time that he is on his way. Opening the door, he is surprised to find Sun Keek and asks what brought her here so late. She frowns and asks where is Chen Nuo. She hasn't seen him for two days, but he pretends to yawn and asks what. He just woke up. She insists she needs to find Nuo. She should talk to Teacher Lai. But he reminds her that it's very late, everyone is already asleep. Cake repeats that he left early. At this moment, the teacher, holding the phone behind his back, presses the call button and the bell rings. He puts the phone to his ear and says hello and asks what he must do. Afterwards, he specifically addresses the director. What a coincidence, he also wants to say something about his daughter. Sun Keek, hearing this, immediately shows a prohibiting gesture with his hand and then folds his hands together, meaning that teacher Lai should not tell her father that she has come. When she runs away, he continues to say no, he doesn't actually have any information. Then he closes the doors and, leaning his back, slides onto the floor, sadly thinking, because of these students, work is too difficult. At this time, the full moon is shining brightly in the sky. Armed people in strict black suits enter the house and run along the corridors. They open the door of the room in which the mother, the boy, and Li and Guang are. He shouts loudly to them, who are they? But one of his subordinates kicks him, knocking him down and shouts at him to get away. Chi Tiang and Chi Jehun, led by Ha Jiang Yi, cross the threshold of the room. He frowns looking down in Chen Nuo, seeing him in the window, understands that it's him. He remembers Li and Guang holding a gun in front of his face asking Nuo, is he a security guard? Then he was late. As for the Lai family, we should start with these three people. Ha Jiang and Li's father are in the shipping business together. In 2000, and the business began to develop successfully. This year, two brothers, Tion and Jihun, who were secretly involved in loan sharking illegal drugs and the black business of buying and selling organs, became interested in the shipping company headed by Father Lee and Jianga. President had joined them, but Lai refused. In the end, the president teamed up with the brothers and left the Lee family. The teenage boy falls to the floor with blood at the mouth, while Ki Tion grabs Ingguan's hand and she screams. Chen Nuo watches this from the window. The clock shows 7.30 in the evening, and he notes that there is still a little time left. Tiong sticks out his tongue as he approaches her and says, Lee Dong Hyuk's daughter is very beautiful. At this moment, Nuo knocks on the glass, and everyone turns around towards the sound. Ki Tiong lets go of Li and Guang and goes to the window and opens it. While Chen Nuo is holding the curtain rod with his hands, he loudly asks, What's the matter? One of his subordinates approaches him and exclaims that a fire truck is visible nearby. Tiang says indignantly, just in time. Jihun says with fear, they can't stay here anymore, they have to leave. It's still night outside. Nuo watches as all the family members are taken into the cars. He recalls activating the fire safety system in an empty house and notes that luckily he was able to use the house next door. Afterwards, he climbs down from the roof to the ground and thinks, next time he needs to calculate the time more accurately. In theory, Dong Hyuk had already died at that time. The only thing that can be done is to save the widow and orphans. It won't be easy. It's easier to kill everyone at once, 
but a large number of corpses will only cause trouble for the widow and orphans. So he must change place. Having run into the garage, he drives out of there in a white car and sets off in pursuit. In one of the black cars with tinted windows, Ha Jiang he remembers how he held a hammer in his hand and shouted to him in a mocking tone, Li Dong Hyuk, is he really here too? In the past, he always scolded him like a dog, got more money, reputation, status. Dong Hyuk took the woman he loved and had two children with her. Ki Jun hands him a cigarette and asks, smiling slyly, what? Is he worried about something? Zhang Yi lights the cigarettes, and he continues, when they get to their destination, that woman will be his. He can do whatever he wants with her. But he, taking a puff, says with a smile, he wants to enjoy not only his wife, but also his daughter Li Donghyuk. Even in hell he will be a loser. After these words, he throws the smoked cigarette out the window. Cars drive up to an abandoned factory in Seoul. The woman with a desperate cry asks to let them go for the sake of past friendship with Donghyuk. But Ha Jiang approaches them with a sadistic smile. The woman tearfully asks him not to do this, but he swings his whip and hits her, inflicting a deep wound on her back. She covers the children with her hands, screaming, why is he doing this? What did they do to him? She feels very sorry for him. His heart is completely rotten. The boy suddenly peeks over his mother's shoulder and screams and rushes at Ha Jiang Yi. But he immediately hits him with his fist, and the three men start kicking him. Lian Guang, looking at this in horror, mentally asks, If this is a dream, then someone should wake her up. Suddenly, the image of Chen Nuo appears before her eyes, and she remembers asking him who it is. What is he saying? He smiled affably at her, and replied that he was a man who fell from heaven to help her get rid of bad dreams. Suddenly, a loud sound is heard, and Nuo drives into the room in a white car. He rams the car in front, and all the people cover their heads with their hands. Inguan also screams in fright, but when she opens her eyes, she sees a car whose door opens and understands it's their car. Getting out of the car and leaning on the door, Chen Nuo says, their car has some problems. While the men are pointing guns at him, he explains, the clutch is a little loose. When accelerating it is well felt. There is also a problem with the steering wheel. Maybe it needs to be changed. Li Guang watches him in bewilderment without moving. When he sees her, he says that they haven't seen Firefly for a long time. Nuo moves closer to Ha Jiang Yi, who she is sitting next to. Inguan looks at him carefully and realizes that it's really him. Tiang annoyedly shouts to Chen Nuo, Who is he? Juhun orders to kill him. A man holding a bat with nails in his hands rushes at him and swings. But Nuo, noticing him, calmly dodges and kicks him in the face in response, causing his cervical vertebra to break, and he falls to the ground, dying with tears in his eyes. Chi Jehun, surprised by this, shouts to the others, what were they staring at? They should just go and kill him. Men holding clubs and sharp daggers run forward, but soon they are all killed. Chen Nuo continues to deal with the remaining ones while Jihun watches. Drops of blood fall on the fabric of the backpack, and the faces of his subordinates are splattered with blood. He looks in horror at Chen Nuo, who is looking at him over his shoulder, holding this briefcase in his hand. Ki Jai Hun yells at Ti Yong to kill him. Jiang agrees, yes, he must do it. He was once the most elite soldier in their frontline forces, so this guy is no match for him. He takes out a dagger while Nuo walks up to him and says with a sigh, he should be reminded that he is the second person to show the knife. Does he know what happened to the first one? Tiyong rushes at him and yells at him to stop talking nonsense. He then tries to strike Chen Nuo early, but he dodges and the dagger flies right next to his neck. Ki Tiyong tries to kick him, but Nuo dodges again, and he leaves a dent in the door. He gets angry and goes on the attack again. Chen Nuo manages to move his head quickly. Then he breaks with his foot and says, Okay, jokes aside. He leans to the side, and at that moment Ti Yong, holding his weapon forward, screams for him to die. But Chen Nuo hits him on the wrist with his fist, throwing the knife to the side. Nuo also punches him in the face, and he freezes, sighing as everything turns red in front of his eyes. Chen Nuo, holding a small blade between his fingers, says contentedly, he's just a show-off. Ha Jong clenches his teeth in indignation. Nuo, watching him run away, asks if he wanted to run away. After that, he takes the backpack and swings it forward, adding that it is useless. Jai Hun sees it hit Jiang Yi right in the back, causing him to fall. The backpack opens and he screams in fear, there were bricks in the bag. Chen Nuo turns to him and asks, what is he looking at? He has to get ready because he's next. He gets lost and, noticing Li Guang on the side, realizes that this is his chance. 
He then reaches out to her and yells for her to come. Holding a knife to her throat, Ki Jai Hen screams, he doesn't care who this guy is, but he seems to care about this little girl. Then he should let him go. With these words, he presses the blade closer to the skin. Nuo frowns and asks Ing Wang if she is very scared. She looks at him with big eyes full of tears. But he tells her with a smile not to be afraid. She looks at him in bewilderment and Chen Nuo, raising his right hand up, explains that he did not want to use this trick. He had not practiced it yet, but he has no choice. Then he snaps his fingers and closes his eyes and concentrates. Blue energy waves begin to emanate from him and he comes closer. Juhun suddenly starts shouting what is happening. He can't move. He feels his body being enveloped by something. Nuo standing opposite them and approaching his face says that he is the third person who showed him the knife today. A weapon also appears in his hand, and pressing Li Guan closer, he plunges a knife into him. Ki Juhun wheezes, rolling his eyes upward. Chen Nuo pushes him on the forehead with his palm, causing him to fall to the floor. After Nuo, stroking her cheek, he asks, is she not scared anymore? She is silent in response. Then he explains that she should not be afraid. He said that he would save her from the nightmare. Two hours later, Li Guang was lying on the sofa in her house, covered with a sweater. Having opened her eyes, she immediately sat up and, looking around, realized that this was her house. Chen Nuo's voice came, is she awake? Leaning against the wall and holding a cup in his hands, he explained that she was too scared and lost consciousness. Afterwards, he drinks the contents of the cup and, putting it on the table, says it was delicious. Approaching her, Nuo asked if she could return his jacket to him. When she lost consciousness, he was afraid that she would freeze, so he covered her. Inguan silently looks at him with big eyes. Chen Nuo tried to take the jacket away, but she still held the fabric tightly with her fingers. He sighed with a smile and repeated that these were his clothes. Then she got embarrassed and let it go. Nuo, putting clothes into a backpack, added that he had warmed up chicken soup. If she was hungry, she could go eat. Her brother was injured, but her mother had already given him medicine. Before she woke up, she and her mother had already discussed everything. She will tell her everything. His advice is not to call the police. In any case, he completely eliminated the problem. After these words, he reached out his hand to her face. Li Guang, noticing this, first touched his palm with her hands and then grabbed it. Nuo looked at her in slight surprise, and she noted why he spoke as if he were much older than her. He looks about her age. Without answering this, he frowned and asked, Was she scared today? All he can say is that he has little time, so he cannot take care of her. He doesn't want her to see scenes like this again. Inguan, still holding his hand, exclaimed, He told her not to be afraid. She's not afraid. But who is he to talk to her like that? Tonight, what even happened? Did he say he came down from heaven? Hearing this, Chen Nuo laughed and stroked her head and asked her not to ask so many questions anymore. Her mother would tell her everything. Thinking, he also added, by the way, he thinks that her mother will be angry. He used non-standard methods. She is sleeping now and will wake up in an hour. As for her brother, he was so angry that he tied him up. Afterwards, he abruptly grabbed her ear and said seriously, she must not forget to study hard. In addition, she is not allowed to use obscene language. Did she remember this? The same goes for tattoos. He got a tattoo at a young age and regretted it. She should not smoke or drink alcohol. She must remember everything he said. Lai Guan looked into his eyes and repeated that she should not use foul language, get tattoos, drink, or smoke. She remembered everything. She will do everything he says. But can he say what his name is? In response to this, Nuo poked her forehead with his finger and said, Children nowadays ask too many questions. Then he got up from the sofa, and she immediately asked excitedly, Is he leaving already? Chen Nuo confirmed it, yes. Or should he stay here until the new year? She silently looked after him until he came to the exit of the room, and asked if he could tell her if he was human. Isn't he an angel? Nuo asked with an irritated grin, Angel, he doesn't believe in God, he only believes in Guan. Suddenly he heard some movement from the suitcase next to him, and he immediately hits it with his foot, shouting for it to stop moving. Inguan is interested and asks what's in the suitcase. Chen Nuo replied that Ha Zhang was there. He will still need it. After that, he turns around and announces, Okay, he's gone. She needs to be careful. But she grabbed his sleeve and they exchanged silent glances. Li Guang asked hopefully if she was seeing him again. He smiled broadly and clarified, Does she like fireflies? She approached him and replied that she liked them. In the summer, her brother took her to catch them. 
At this moment, Chen Nuo reached out to her neck with his hand, and a small glow appeared from under his fingers. But she hugs him sharply, and he finally tells her not to catch fireflies anymore. Inguan closed her eyes and buried herself in his shoulder. After that, in the darkness, she saw his image and, reaching out to him with her hand, mentally asked him not to leave. Li Guang suddenly opens his eyes with a cry, he must not leave. But when she sees that she woke up on the sofa, covered with a blanket, she understands that he really left. Suddenly something comes to her mind, and she, inspired, gets off the couch and thinks about what she needs in her office. Sitting in the room at the table, illuminated by the light of the lamp, she diligently wrote and said out loud, she should not start drinking. What else was there? Lai Yingwang suddenly screams, remembers something and writes that she must believe Guan, but who is it? She also remembers the emblem and notes, that's right, there were also clothes. She diligently tries to write the characters that she memorized and notes with relief that it seems to be Chinese. Inguan, looking at them, remembers that there was a Chinese dictionary in his brother's office. Arriving in the room, she runs her hand along the bookshelves. At this moment, her brother is hanging head down outside the window. Taking one of the books, she reads that Zhongning is the name of a place, the location of an old mansion in the city of Jinling. The poor brother, with a towel in his mouth, staggers from side to side and tries to shout to her. In Ha Jiongye's secret residence in Seoul, Chen Nuo, wearing white gloves, unzips a suitcase, inside of which lies Jiang, tear-stained and with a bruise around his eye. He, being in an uncomfortable position, shouts who this guy is so rude, he grabs him by the leg and silently drags him down the corridor to another room. Moving a drawer away from the wall to reveal a built-in safe, Nuo briefly says, they make a deal, he must open it. Ha Jiang asks, hopefully, will he let him go then? But Nuo explains that he will allow him to die with dignity. He asks again in fear, with dignity. Chen Nuo explains, that's right, he will be able to choose any clothes from the closet that he thinks will be the most decent, wear them, then die. Isn't that worthy? But he turns over from his back to his stomach and sobs loudly and asks to let him go. He really asks to let him go. He can pay him, give him as much money as he wants, he will give him everything. Only the guy shouldn't kill him, he doesn't want to die. Nuo just points to the combination lock and orders him to open it. Ha Jong doesn't calm down, he has to let him go. The guy needs to let go. There is a ledger there. Everything is written down inside. When the safe is open, Chen Nuo takes the book and throws it back to clarify, is it? He is not interested in his machinations. He just needs money for food. Having put all the wads of money into his backpack, he notices a picture on the wall. Taking Zhang He by the hair and raising his head up, he asks if this is his boat. How fast is it? He explains that the maximum speed is 30 knots. Nuo says with a sly smile, then he will add one more condition, he wants this. Ha Zhang immediately shouts back, then he will have to let go. He's changing this for his life. Chen Nuo agrees, smiling, okay, in that case they agreed, he will let him go. Where is the boat? Soon it floats on the sea, while a cheerful song is heard from the deck. Nuo, holding the steering wheel, sings along, woof woof. A few hours ago, a bald man tied with a rope and with a chain chained to his leg was screaming. The guy must have confused him with someone, he doesn't know him, so why is he going to kill him? Zhang is also lying next to him, chained, breathing heavily. Chen Nuo says he doesn't think it's a mistake. The daughter of his friend Li Guang took refuge with them when she was running away from bandits. But who would have thought that he would want to mock her? The man screams furiously, what is he saying? He doesn't understand what he means. Nuo, pushing the barrel into the water with his foot, angrily says, the owner of hell will explain to them when they go down. It falls off the boat, dragging Jiang He and the bald man down. A huge splash appears on the water, and Nuo thoughtfully notes that he almost forgot that he is Yan Nuo, which actually means the master of hell. Blood starts flowing from his nose, and he wipes it and thinks, of course he should be more careful with his tricks. I spent a lot of effort to save them, and these are the consequences. After this, Nuo begins to wave his arms and dance to the beat of the music. At the end, he raises his middle finger and takes on a serious look. In the auditorium of Yandan School, a man standing in the middle of the stage and holding a microphone loudly announces that this is the last joint event. Everyone present needs to pay attention to the leading teachers of Zhongning City No. 8 Middle School. All students must attend. Sitting in the hall with the rest of the students, Sun Keek looks to the side and, noticing an empty place, understands that Chen Nuo did not come anymore. She hasn't seen him for four days. 
The man on stage compliments, if any of the students are missing, the students and teachers will be severely punished. Teacher Lai is sitting near a brick fence, smoking a cigarette. Suddenly, he clutches his head and exclaims why he is so obsessed with money. Lai stubs out his cigarette on his soul, biting his lip and resolutely thinks that this time he will kill this little Nuo. Suddenly looking at the ground, he sees someone approaching him. The team leader, Director Fang, frowning and looking down, asks, didn't Lion say that a student named Chen Nuo would arrive soon? It's been half an hour already. Where is he? And says hesitantly, he went to the nearest internet cafe to play. The director knows that boys his age really like to play computer games. At this moment, he thinks with hope that this will be enough. Fan, looking at his wristwatch, replies, he hopes that's true. There is still half an hour before the event starts. He will ask to teach and the students to help find him. He also hopes that nothing bad happened to him. After taking a step forward and pointing his finger at Lai An, he added, but what about him? He had to go with him. When the time comes and we'll see what he will do to him. He answers, worried and trying to smile, Director Fan can be sure that the student is not lost. After waving after him, he adds that he wishes him a pleasant journey. When Fan leaves, he exclaims with irritation, it can't be. Wasn't he just sent by the Education Bureau as an assistant director? Everyone flatters him and calls him director. Does he really think that he is above this? And clenches his fist, wanting to say something, but then he just angrily thinks about where this Chen Nuo is. Half an hour later, Director Fang asks menacingly, have they found Nuo? Cake excitedly asks to call the police. A classmate is lost, they can't find him, so the teacher has to call the police. He thinks no. If they call the police, he will be fired as the teen leader. But no one can replace him, and his future will go downhill. She insistently repeats, Chen Nuo is lost. Why is he hesitating? He should hurry up and call the police. What if something happens to him? Fan, thinking about the situation, suggests they should look for him again. If they look, they might find something they didn't notice before. Sun Keek does not give up and shouts, teacher. But suddenly, he also says right. He then approaches Lai An and notes that he lives with him. Has Nuo ever mentioned that he has friends or family in the area? Maybe he went there. But he fearfully replies that he doesn't remember. Then Fan asks where his luggage is. Anne explains that everything is in the room. The director turns to the others and announces they are going to look. Maybe there is something like a contact address in the suitcase. Returning to the dorm, Director Fang is the first to walk up the stairs. When they stop at the front door, Lai An, with trembling hands, takes the key out of his pocket and tries to get into the keyhole. Fan yells at him to hurry up. He closes his eyes when suddenly the door opens and then looks forward in bewilderment. Someone appears on the threshold, causing him to start screaming incoherently and realizing with relief what a scoundrel he is. He is back. Cake screams and closes her eyes in embarrassment. Chen Nuo stands in the doorway with one towel on his hips and another on his shoulders. While Lion is sitting in a chair in the corner of the room, Nuo stands in front of Director Fan, hanging his head in shame and rubbing his neck, he explains, he went to the internet cafe to play a little. Fan points his finger at him and screams very angry, he has no discipline, he has no organization, this is all nonsense, he needs to be at least a little organized. What did the teachers teach him? What kind of student he is? When they return, he will be punished. And further, he should write a book review. He should think carefully about what kind of behavior the student should have. Chen Nuo frowns over his shoulder at An, who is very frightened and immediately tells the director that their little trip is almost over. The event is about to begin. But he crossed his arms and explained that, fortunately for him, he already had a lot to do today. After that, he goes out on business, as long as Lion kindly shouts at his back, Director Fang can be sure that he will definitely take care of raising the guy. He will take him away. When he closed the door, Nuo, sitting in the chair behind him, slyly said, It seems to him that they will become friends together with the teacher. He responded by shouting at him, This time he deceived the teacher, the school will remember this. Chen Nuo took the phone with the delete option on the screen and reminded, Well, as a sign of reconciliation, he deleted this video. How about peace? He is a man of his word. The teacher should not worry and believe him. And replied dissatisfiedly, he thinks Chen Nuo is a real scoundrel. There is a bright light in the dorm windows. Nuo walked up to room number 502 and knocked. The door opened and a girl with chubby cheeks appeared in the doorway, who asked in surprise, is it him? What does he need? He asked where Keek was. The girl explained with a sly smile that she was in the shower. Is he looking for her? Chen Nuo looked into the room while Sun Keek was taking a hot shower. 
Afterwards, he crossed his arms and strictly ordered the girl to tell her that he was waiting for her on the roof. Soon he was standing on the roof next to the dorm sign. Cake opened the door and also approached him. Nuo, noticing her presence, turned and said, as she could see, it was snowing outside. She just looked at him with silent delight. Then Chen Nuo asked her to come even closer. When she did this, he handed her a can of soda and added, This is for her. She looked at this in confusion and replied, It's too late to drink this. She might get fat. Nuo, looking at her intently, added, It would be nice if she gained weight. Sun Keek, taking the jar, said dissatisfiedly that she didn't like it. But after taking a sip, she thought that it was still delicious. Chen Nuo smiled and said enthusiastically, She should know that he is in a very good mood today. Cake looked at him tenderly and asked why. He, putting his hand out in the air and catching snowflakes, suggested that perhaps he had done what he had always wanted to do. She asked hopefully, did he want to look at the snow with her? Nuo said without answering the question, he had heard people say before that life is always full of regret. Life is beautiful but difficult. Suddenly he clenches his fist and exclaims, he's so sorry. If there is a gap between the living and inanimate world, then it is a matter of time. They are hostages of their lives, he can be completely independent. But Sun Keek, as if not listening to him, thought only about how handsome he was. Chen Nuo turned to her with a smile and asked if she could answer him one question. She looked down and clasped the soda can with both hands and answered, he can talk. At that moment she thought, he's not going to offer her strange things. At most she will allow him to hold her hand, he cannot kiss her. But if he still decides to kiss, then you can't kiss on the lips, you can't take risks. Nuo, embarrassedly scratching the back of his head and smiling, asked if she could help him write a book review. Can it help with writing just one review? Hearing this, Keek disappointedly asked him, what? It was snowing outside. There was a radio in the director's office, which reported that due to the continued cold wind from the south, there would be heavy snowfall in the Jinling area today. The presenter asks all citizens to stay warm and adhere to safety measures. Shanley, sitting behind the chair, looked thoughtful and said, he just returned yesterday and hopes that they take everything seriously. Besides, what happened to Keek and that classmate named Chen Nuo? The day before, Jinling Railway Station. Nuo put his arm around Keek to help her get off the train, and their gazes were directed at each other. Keek looked at him in love, but suddenly her father appeared next to her, coughing next to them with anger. Keek turned to him in surprise and said, Dad? Didn't he say he wouldn't come here? He closed his eyes, rose from his chair, and wondered. She couldn't fall in love so early, could she? He left the office with a thermos in his hands and looked into the office through the window, and when he went inside and stood behind the counter, the surrounding children began to whisper among themselves that the director had arrived. Many wondered why he was here. Did one of your classmates do something wrong? Maybe he wants to announce something interesting. Someone heard that there is some bad news. Will he really talk about it? Where is Master Wu? He won't come. Everything is over. Is it really the end for them? While such assumptions were heard in the class, Nuo was safely asleep at his desk. He opened his eyes, paid attention to those around him, and thought that it suddenly became quiet. What kind of atmosphere was this? After that, he saw the director in front of him, muttering something and thinking, What a horror! Shingli spoke meanwhile, asking the students to let him announce that Teacher Wu went outside last night and got injured due to the snowfall, so he will be replacing him for some time, and in order to better understand their level, he prepared a test. He hopes they all write it well. He adjusted his glasses and said that if they failed this test, they would stay after school to clear snow on the playground. His gaze was directed at Nuo, whose face saddened, and he mentally wondered if he was imagining all this. He feels like a target. After school, with an even sadder look, he swept the street and removed the snow, asking himself that a man's intuition is really not wrong, but how did he offend him? Cake immediately ran out to him with a joyful expression on her face and a thermos in one hand and a broom in the other. He turned around and asked what she was doing here. She offered him a drink and said that she had come to help him. Shanley watched what was happening from the window and, gritting his teeth in anger, said that this little idiot was influencing his daughter. On the second day, he started shouting at Nuo and expressing his emotions, saying that he would stay after school to clear snow because he was copying an assignment from his classmates. He answered with a dissatisfied look that in fact he was able to pass the test today. On the third day, Shenley pointed him in the direction of the bicycles and again said that he would stay after school to clear the snow because he had not done his homework. Nuo replied that there was no test today. 
On the fourth day, the director approached him with the same assignment, but Nuo told him that there was no test today and he had turned in his homework. He asked him again, in what year was the 15th National Congress held? Nuo responded immediately, from September 12 to 18, 1997. Shanley asked another question, how many people took part? Nuo replied, 2074, to which the director asked for their names, but Nuo was unable to do so. On the fifth day, Shingli burst into the office during a lesson with another teacher and shouted Chen Nuo's name. Nuo bowed his head and took a deep breath, after which he stood up from his place with a broom and Shanley asked what he was doing about it. He replied that he was already going to clear the snow and was waiting for the teacher. Shanley said that he would remove the snow later, there is no need to do this today, but he must come to his office. After some time, a man in uniform appeared in the director's office, is he Chen Nuo? Xing Li introduced the gentleman to Nuo and said that this was Mr. Cheng from Longton Prison. Nuo asked him in surprise what happened. He replied that the fact is that his mother, Uzi Yuhua, is undergoing rehabilitation in their prison, and because of her good work last year, she was approved to visit relatives. But he doesn't know why he never visited her. Nuo realized that this happened before he was reborn, and he simply didn't know about it. Cheng came closer and said that this is the reason she asked him to talk to him. She misses him very much. Boy, doesn't he really want to visit his mom? Nuo looked down and thought, because of his family relationship, he thinks he can understand why he didn't visit her. Shanley sadly watched what was happening and thought that this child was most likely in great pain deep down. He immediately turned to Mr. Brinsheng, pushing Nuo aside and asked to speak with his student. Why don't they come back? Zhang, after thinking a little, replied that in general he wants to say that visiting relatives contributes to the ideological changes of prisoners, and he hopes that children understand this best of all. Shanley started yelling at him to stop saying things like that because he was just a child. He's putting too much pressure on him. He is his teacher and will talk to him on his own. Mr. Zhang, he better go back, and if something happens, he will call him. Nuo thought about the director's insistence, and Zhang answered him, okay, then he won't interfere. He walked further down the corridor and Shanley, looking after him, went back into the office and thought that he was just an unhappy child. He sat down next to him on the sofa and said that he had read the school file to understand his situation in the family, and he had learned a lot from Mr. Kang Jing now and didn't think it was so difficult. He is a very smart child and takes care of himself, but you shouldn't put too much strain on yourself psychologically. If any difficulties arise, he can talk to him. He immediately looked at his watch and said that it was already late and he was probably hungry, so he was inviting him to eat at his place. Nuo looked at him in surprise. The lights came on on the street. Cake was relaxing in her pajamas on the sofa and eating corn when she suddenly heard the door open. She was delighted to see her father return, but when she saw the joyful Nuo behind him, waving his hand at her, she was dumbfounded. He greeted her, and she dropped the corn in surprise and immediately ran into the other room, slamming it hard. She sat down on the floor, became very embarrassed, and wondered, Chen Nuo, why did he come to her house? She was dressed inappropriately and was also eating at that moment. Nuo grinned and looked towards the door and said that she was very nice. Shanley clenched his hand into a fist and thought that he had made a mistake and brought the wolf into the house, after which he touched his key and asked him to change his shoes and step into the living room to do his homework. After a while, Cake left the room, changed into a cute robe, and said with embarrassment, Dad, why did he come? Shingli replied that he brought him to dinner, and they both had to do their homework conscientiously. When suddenly he started shouting, Chen Nuo, he does his homework in the dining room and Keek in the living room. They shouldn't talk to each other. After a while, the guys were doing homework in different rooms, but looked at each other. Cake thought that he was pretending, because he is not afraid of her father. Nuo looked at his notebook, after which he crumpled up a piece of paper and called out to Cake, who turned around at him, and he threw a ball of paper right on her table. She opened it and read that her dad was following him. She wondered if he was waiting for her father's approval. At this moment, Shanley was actually watching what was happening, pretending to read the newspaper behind them, and thinking that this little guy was acting as if he was not here at all. It was already 23 minutes past 7 and Nuo called Cake again, and threw a paper on her table with a note in which he asked what was happening to her father. He's reading a newspaper from two days ago, is he okay? She laughed, covering her mouth, and at that moment the father became very angry, squeezed the newspaper in his hands, and thought with hatred that this guy was a freak. He called her 32 times, and she looked at him 57 times. 
You just can't stand it now. He shouted Cake's name with incredible fury. She got scared and said, Dad. He remained silent, after which he said that it was already half past seven and her mother was probably working late. He would go and buy them something to eat. He left the room and said that he didn't want to see it anymore. He just won't let him come to their house ever again. After some time, they sat down to dinner together and Shenley suggested that they quickly eat duck meat. He is just at the age when he needs to eat a lot to grow up healthy. Keek picked up the duck with chopsticks and practically put it in Nuo's plate, who brought it to her, but suddenly she saw her father's menacing look and put it to him, grinning for him to eat it. Three hours later, they were still sitting at the table having dinner. Shenley turned to Nuo and said that he had already eaten and he should go home because it was not safe outside if it was too late. Nuo replied, without having time to finish chewing his food, that everything was fine, he was used to walking at night. It's quite convenient. He touched his stomach with a smile and asked Cake to give him another portion. She reached out with her hands to his plate, but suddenly Shenley jumped up from his seat, hit the table and shouted that he said that he had already eaten and there would be no more for him. Moments later, Nuo was kicked out the door and Cake shouted, Dad! Nuo turned around and wondered if he should worry about his relationship with his father-in-law. He walked along the corridor and saw a pretty woman approaching the door of their apartment. He looked at her and noticed something was wrong, thinking that she was very similar to Cake's mother. He went out into the street and suddenly a dark car drove up to him, the window of which opened and someone's hand was visible from there. He realized something and remembered how he passed by her mother, turned to the car and thought. He smelled the same smell from cigarettes as from his mother. He immediately turned towards the window of their apartment and thought about the director. On Monday morning, I spent my free time at the Internet Café Nuo with a cigarette in my mouth. He was quickly typing something on the keyboard when suddenly a man approached him and hit him on the arm. It was Shenley who threateningly asked him why he was skipping classes. He's been looking for it all morning. Nuo looked at him silently with an arrogant expression on his face, after which he reached into his pocket and took out a box of cigarettes, offering him one and asking him not to stand with such a stone face because it was better to smoke. Shanley wondered where he learned to talk like that. He took the cigarette from him and sat down on a chair next to him, after which Nuo, with a smile on his face, offered him a lighter and said that he should take it, otherwise he would be lonely. Shanley looked at this silently and snatched a box of cigarettes, saying that he should not follow the example of these youngsters in order to appear cool. When he grows up, he will come to his senses and understand how funny and naive this is. He smoked one and continued to say that at their age he understands that this is the rebellious period of youth and even when there are difficulties at home. He knows that he is a very temperamental guy and doesn't like to deal with other people, but has he ever planned his future? Nuo asked with a grin, the future. The director asked another question, so what is he going to do in the future? What will this be connected with? He doesn't want to see him become a bully. He will be very upset if he wants to become like that. Nuo replied, teacher, in fact, everything is not like that. He is not a problem child, as he thinks. He wants to become an adult fish and thinks it will be good. Shanley asked him back in surprise, an adult fish? He replied, straightening his arms, that he actually enjoyed the boredom, the peace, the freedom, and the fact that no one bothered him, that he had nothing to worry about and wanted to just eat, drink, and make ends meet. He also wants to warm up in the sun and look at the snow in winter, and sometimes pester his daughter. The director became very tense, Nuo jumped up and told him that he was just joking. Principal, he's a good man and a good teacher, but he should leave him alone, okay? He is not one to go astray. In reality, he just wants to mess around and be bored sometimes. Shanley said that he needed to think about the future. What will he live on? He imagined a lot of dollar bills in front of him and thought, tens of thousands of dollars and gold bars will be enough for some time, and if he goes on similar missions a couple more times, he will be able to go to the center to buy dozens of apartments, he will wait until prices rise in 20 years, and will be the landlord who collects the rent. He has no reason to work. Shanley pulled out an envelope from his pocket, placed it in his hands, and said that it was a letter of recommendation. He spent a lot of effort helping him find a part-time job and negotiated the working hours and benefits, he can be sure of that. In the last two years, he can save money and not spend it easily. It will be enough for his college education, and he can work and study hard to earn some expenses and living expenses, although it is a little hard and tiring, but it will help him avoid poverty in the future. Nuo asked if anyone told him that he was a very good person. 
At that very moment, I thought that in 20 years, such good people like him would simply die out in society. Shanley asked him to stop chatting because he was annoying him. He should think before he says anything. Now he has classes in the afternoon, and he has to go. In the evening, Nua walked down the street and scratched the back of his head and said that he was very tired, but such idleness is cool. He apologizes to the principal, but tomorrow he will continue to skip classes and sooner or later he will figure it out, and tomorrow he will go to prison. In any case, this image belongs to him, and he needs to pretend to be the real Chan Nuo. Early the next morning, Longton Prison. He stood near the front door with two packages, saying into the microphone at the entrance that his name was Chen Nuo, and last night he agreed to meet with them. One of the guys working in the prison told Uzi Yuhua that her son came to visit her. She went to the window, sat down opposite him, and picked up the phone, saying with tears in her eyes that he was her little Chen. She began to sob heavily and say in a trembling voice that he refused to come to see her. Does he really hate her that much? He looked at her with a smile and replied that before he had trouble understanding some things and it hurt him, but now he feels relieved, he honestly doesn't hate her. She asked again with hope, is this true? He replied yes, he brought her a lot of chocolate and cookies. Prison life must not be easy, right? She replied, wiping away her tears, no, it's not that hard, she's fine and he shouldn't worry. What about him? He is fine? Nuo said that he was doing well. His teacher and classmates were taking care of him. Zuhua clenched her hand into a fist with joy and said that this is great, this is very good, after which she turned to him and said that she would try very hard to leave earlier. He should wait until she comes out and they will definitely catch up, okay? A prison officer approached her from behind and said that there was little time left. Nuo looked into her eyes and replied, okay. Finally, she said that she asked him for forgiveness and wanted to ask him for something. She knows she has no right, but she can't trust anyone anymore. This is her mom's daughter, who is her half-sister. Can he visit her? She is now five years old, and she is really worried about her. She often has bad dreams. If it's not difficult for him, can he see her? It doesn't matter, even if he doesn't want to. But his mother has already done it. It's all his mother's fault. She continued to sob, and he wondered in surprise, does he still have a younger sister? He exhaled and said, okay, he will definitely visit her. After some time, he arrived at the place with the office staff of the Women's Federation, Liu, who said that it was here. He addressed her by her last name and said that he would go buy sweets for the children, cigarettes and drinks before they came in. She answered, okay, and looking after him, she thought that this guy was quite smart. He picked up a whole bag of groceries and followed her while she told him that she had visited his sister several times. She was very sweet and beautiful, and it was pleasant to be around her. Due to her parents' special situation, they did not have enough money to support her, so their federation allocated funds and sends them an additional 200 yuan every month. Every day she transfers this money to the foster family's account. Nua replied that she was very kind, and thought that after Ziyuhua and her father went to prison, their daughter was given to her father's younger brother to be raised, and after listening to her, he thinks that his sister's life is much better than Wu Chen Nuo after the death of her grandmother. After a while, they arrived at the apartment, and Mrs. Thadeliu knocked on the door. The door was opened by a girl who was glad that she had come and invited them to come inside the house. Nuo followed her in and noticed a gray-haired woman sitting on the sofa opposite the TV, who was watching cartoons. Liu introduced Nuo to Uncle Gu and Aunt Fang, telling them that they had a new family member and it was Chen Nuo. Gu examined him and said his name, after which Nuo came closer, he gave a bag of groceries and apologized for the trouble, saying that he did not want to cause them any inconvenience, but he came here to see his little sister. Gu took the bag and saw a lot of sweets there after which he invited him to sit on the sofa and said that he would ask him to bring her, because she really likes to play in her room. After a while, he saw a cute little girl approaching him, holding Aunt Fang's hand. Fan stroked her head and told her that this was her older brother and she should say hello to him. She became very embarrassed, hugged her toy and said, Brother, okay. Nuo approached her and Gu said that she was a little shy and didn't talk much, but they raised her well. Fan confirmed this and added that they adore their niece. He should look at the sweater they bought recently, it's really cheap. There were a lot of threads sticking out from the sweater, and the poor quality of the product was evident. The girl stood silently, bowing her head. After that, Aunt Fang put on an apron, turned to her husband, and asked him to take care of Liu and the others while she went to the kitchen and prepared dinner. 
Nuo peeled the banana and asked his sister if she would have it. She looked into his eyes with sadness, after which she sharply turned to Uncle Gu, and he told her with a feeling of shame that her brother cleaned this for her and she could eat. She grabbed a banana and stuffed it into her mouth with gusto. Nuo handed her a pack of candies and said that she could keep this because it was another delicious thing. She reached out to grab it with her hand, but suddenly the guy snatched the pack from her hands and shouted that this was a tasty product for him and he would eat it. He began to tease her, and Gu calmly said that this was childish behavior and they were used to fighting at such times. Nuo suspected something was wrong and told him that children at that age are very mischievous and it must be very difficult for them to raise too. Gu said that this is not true at all. Fan said that lunch was already ready and set the table. They sat down opposite each other and the aunt served the girl's dish and said that it was for her. Because she loves chicken meat most of all and Gu said that he should eat and not worry and also feel at home. She turned to Chen and also told him to eat more, and Gu suggested that he come to him more often when he has time. After lunch, when Liu and Nuo went to the community gate, Liu said that she was very sorry for his sister, that such an incident happened to her parents at a young age. Fortunately, the child was doing well. Chen Nuo, he doesn't need to worry. Their women's federation monitors the children's lives, and they won't allow them to be bullied. He scratched the back of his head and said that in this case he relied on her. She replied that there was no need to thank her, and in that case she was already leaving, because she had a lot of things to deal with. He looked after her and thought, although Miss Liu is full of enthusiasm, she is still young and inexperienced, and he is afraid that she might have missed out on many things. A change of clothes is hanging on the balcony, but there are no little girl's clothes there, which means that she has quite a few clothes, and this has been changed a long time ago. The sweater on her looked clean, but there were a lot of threads sticking out on her nails, and her clothes didn't look like the girl's style. Most likely she wears the clothes for their son. She was so hungry that there was not a single grain of rice left at the bottom of her bowl, and not even a piece of meat left on the bone, which means that on normal days she does not eat. An allowance of 200 yuan per month is quite a lot of money. No wonder Zuhua was so worried and begged to come and see. He lit another cigarette, exhaled deeply and thought, looking at the sky, that he had taken his life and even if so, he would do something for his family. After some time, he returned to their apartment and carefully opened its doors and asked again, what is it? He was holding a package in his hands. Nuo's menacing gaze was directed to the other side of the room, where his sister was crying, and Aunt Fan stood above her with a stick in her hands and shouted that she should stop crying so loudly and she should keep her mouth closed. The girl continued to cry loudly and lay on the floor, huddled in a ball, while her aunt shouted that she was nothing but losses and she should wash the dishes and not beat it. Enough! She did it on purpose. Gu got scared and pushed Nuo aside and shouted to him why he had come again. Fan turned in his direction in surprise and Nuo screamed with incredible anger, pushing Gu straight into the apartment with his foot. How do they treat his sister? The garbage bag flew out of Gu's hands and everything scattered on the floor, and he screamed loudly. Fan got angry and ran straight at him, shouting that he had hit her husband. He doesn't dare touch it. Nuo easily pushed her aside and told her to get out of the way. She groaned from the collision, he approached the retreating Gu, who looked at him questioningly, but Nuo grabbed his leg and Gu shouted, Chen Nuo. Gu screamed in fear. What was he going to do? The elderly man stood up from the sofa and shouted to let his son go. The grandmother grabbed him by the clothes and continued screaming. He grinned and said, It means she's not dead yet. When her daughter-in-law hits her granddaughter, can she sit quietly and watch it? This is a five-year-old child. How can she look at this? She screamed back angrily, but who cares how old she is? A pest is a pest. Because of him, her son went to prison and their family is nothing but harm. He grinned and said that everything was clear. That means she was as vile as they were. He brought Gu's body to the balcony, and with one hand held him by the leg, throwing him over the side of the balcony. Gu was very frightened and screamed loudly with tears in his eyes to be saved as he was being killed. Nuo asked him not to scream, because if he screamed, he would just let him go. He also turned to his family members and told them not to come, because if they did, he would definitely let him go. Fan grabbed her grandmother and shouted at her not to provoke him, after which she turned to Chen as if she were a child and asked her not to touch her husband. If he had something to say, then let him say it. He smiled and said, well, finally they can talk like humans. 
He abruptly pulled back Gu's leg and threw him back into the apartment straight onto the floor with incredible force, which made him scream in pain, and his grandmother screamed in fear, son. She approached Gu, hugged him and shouted to Nuo that he was a freak. How dare he do that? His father didn't raise him enough with a belt. She wishes him that his car would run over. Fan screamed at him that he knew he was breaking the law. She will call the police and he will be caught. He smirked as he looked at the goo who shouted at them to shut up. Did they really want him to kill him? He stretched out his hand and said, Little Chen, friend, he invites him not to worry and to discuss all the points. Nuo said that this was already interesting and turned away, after which a huge knife appeared in his hand. All family members got scared and started screaming, and the grandmother stood up for them and shouted that she suggested it was better to kill her because she was already old enough. He smiled and asked them to calm down, telling them that he would not use a knife today. He put it on the table and said that if they do not want bloodshed, then they must answer honestly. Fang pointed her finger at him and shouted, Isn't he afraid of the consequences if he does this? She promises that she will lock him behind bars. Gu and the old woman looked at him in bewilderment, and he answered with confidence that he was not afraid of anything. He had not harmed anyone today, and even if the police came and took him away, then at best they would scold him and try to educate him. And then, when he comes out, will they guess who he will come to? They all live here together, so they won't be able to run far from here. Do they think that he won't dare come to them with a knife? Do they really want to test this? Fang became wary and exclaimed, and Gu turned around and shouted that if she didn't want to kill them, then she should just shut up. His legs were shaking, and he tried to get up, after which he walked closer to Nuo and asked a question with a sad look. What does he want? He won't create problems just to vent his anger, will he? He and his sister, but before he could finish speaking, Nuo said that he didn't want to talk to him, and everything was clear to him here, and he would take his sister with him. Fan turned to her frightened husband and said, They live off guardianship. Nuo asked again, Is it only 200 yuan per month? Do they still receive child support from their parents? The couple silently looked at each other and Nuo said that he didn't need it, not a single coin, and they could keep all the payments and formally the child would be on them, but he would take her with him and she would live with him. Gu looked away and tried to say something, when suddenly Nuo swung his leg and hit him right in the knee, from which he flew to the side in horror and Nuo delivered another blow, from which Gu's face was greatly distorted. Nuo stood over him and told him to listen to him, because he was not going to continue talking to him like that, he had already said what he was going to do. Of course, they may experience the consequences of disagreement. He is only one, but there are four of them. His son is now seven years old. After the question was asked, Aunt Fan covered her mouth with her hand, very frightened, after which she began to shout loudly to go and take her, rather, quickly take her with him, just let him not come to the door from now on, and they will not interfere with each other's lives. He smiled and replied, good, he will take her, and then they will not see each other again. He approached the frightened girl, sitting near the wall, whose legs were wounded from domestic violence, and he told her that perhaps she did not understand yet, but he was her brother and they had the same mother. Would she like to live with him? She will be able to eat whatever he eats and no one will beat her. She looked at him with love and tears in her eyes and replied that she agreed. He smiled and said that in this case they agreed and from now on she can call him brother. He removed the tears from her eyes and she said brother. He answered, right? And then asked her what her name was. She replied that she was a goose eye eye. Nuo got angry, turned towards his relatives and said that there was nothing good in this family. Now she will go with him, her last name is Chen, and her first name is Chen Zaioi. They left the apartment and after some time walked along the street. Zaioi was holding candy in her hand and looked quite happy. She was also dressed in new clothes, and Nuo was walking next to her with a happy expression and many bags in his hands. When they approached the apartment, there was a Keek standing near the entrance, who saw him with the girl and said in surprise, Chen Nuo. He came closer to her and asked why she came here. She replied that she called him, but for some reason he didn't pick up. He looked at his phone and replied that he hadn't noticed it. Keek drew attention to his sister and said with admiration, What a sweet girl. She leaned closer to her and asked with a smile who she was. Where did he get it? He mockingly told her that this was his daughter and whispered that she should call him dad. She muttered something in response to him and Keek fell to the ground in fear, asking again in bewilderment, Dad. Zioi looked at her silently. After which she turned to Nuo as a brother and asked again, Did she say everything correctly? 
Keek realized what was going on and exhaled, after which she ran up to Nuo and started beating him, shouting that he wasn't serious about it. He grinned and asked again why she was looking for him. She looked at him and asked a question, where did he go these days? Does he know how much her dad cared about him? The other day he came down his street on his bicycle several times to tell him about the job. When he returned last night, he was limping and said he had fallen off his bike. He also got his feet wet and they were all bruised. Nuo asked how long she had been waiting for him. She looked at him in surprise. He touched her hand and said that it was very cold outside. So how long did she wait for him? She became embarrassed, lowered her gaze, and replied that she had not waited long. He led her by the hand closer to the house and said that she would go with them. She abruptly pulled her hand away and replied that there was no need to do this. Zayoi looked at them and wondered if brother and this girl were dating. Is she superfluous here? Nuo grinned and said that it was already quite dark, and he was a little uncomfortable, they would go to another place. They went to a fast food restaurant and sat down at a table, ordering a lot of food. Nuo asked Cake, does her dad like to mind his own business? She replied that this was not entirely true. Previously, when her father was a class teacher, he would invite one student home for dinner. That student had no relatives, he also studied poorly, and therefore often skipped classes and got into fights. One day, to protect him, Dad hugged him and didn't want to let go, but he pushed him straight to the ground. Later that boy came to them at night and fell to his knees in front of her, sniffling and crying, saying that he was sorry for his behavior. He begged his father to leave him alone. His father was uncomfortable. A few years later, something happened to this boy. He was stabbed to death on the street, and after that his father stopped going to work for a while, and his mother began to quarrel with him often because of this, and also, if he does not start attending classes, he will have fewer benefits and an unstable income in the future. Nuo grinned again and said that he understood everything. Her dad saw a reflection of that guy in him and doesn't want him to become just like him. After that, he turned his attention to his sister and asked her what was happening. Why doesn't she eat? He brought the tray closer to her face and asked her to eat. She picked up the burger and said that her brother should do it first, but before she could finish speaking, Nuo began to feed her with his own hands and said that there was nothing wrong, he had everything, and she should eat it herself. The waitress brought another tray of ice cream and said that it was ready. Zayoi was delighted when she saw it in front of her face, took a spoon and tasted the ice cream, which made her eyes sparkle. After that, she offered the spoon to Nuo. He looked at her in surprise, and she asked him again with tears in her eyes, so that he would not give it back, okay? She will not bother you and will wash herself and sleep. She will also sweep the floor, wipe the table, and cook rice. Nuo hugged her face and asked her again, didn't he tell her that in the future she would live with him and would never return to this terrible place? She emotionally responded, okay, brother, she will be obedient and flexible. Cake, who also took the spoon in her hands, asked him again, is she really his sister? He talks to her so nicely, it's not like him at all. He replied that everything is not simple here, a few words will not do. He stroked her head and asked her question, she won't go home for dinner, won't dad look for her? She should tell him that she is with him, and then he can sweep the playground again. She became sad and told him that mom and dad had a fight today. He replied that this is normal for them. Keek expressed that her father has never argued with her before, and she doesn't even know what's going on lately. Her mother is busy at work, and now every time she comes back, she feels that she is always nagging her father. He asked her not to interfere in the affairs of adults, to which Cake replied that it was quite old-fashioned, and her dad told her the same thing. He gave her 50 yuan today and asked her to go play with her classmates so as not to stay at home. He gave her his hand, and she looked at it questioningly, after which she asked what it was. He invited her to divide the money equally, but Dad gave her 50 yuan, didn't he? She pulled back her hand and said, sticking out her tongue, that he was daydreaming. After some time, they finally approached the entrance to the Keek apartment building, and she said that it was time for her to go home and thanked her for seeing her off. Zayoi waved her hand with a smile and said goodbye. Cake stretched her arms towards her, but Nuo thought that she was reaching out to hug him, but missed and said that he was just walking her home and she was ready to hug him. Meanwhile, Keek was hugging his sister and he was petrified with surprise. Cake said, squeezing his sister, that she was very sweet. Why doesn't she tell her brother that she will spend the night at her house tonight? Nuo grabbed her hand and said that they needed to go home while Cake entered the entrance. Suddenly, a black car appeared in front of him again, in which Keek's mother was sitting in the front seat next to a man smoking a cigarette. 
The woman looked into the distance and Nuo realized that it was she, but reacted to this with his silence. The next morning he woke up in his apartment with his sister, who woke him up and invited him to go have breakfast. He went into the bathroom to take his morning routine, grabbed a glass with his toothbrush, next to which stood a smaller glass with his sister's toothbrush. When he left the bathroom and came into the kitchen, wiping his head with a towel, he was surprised by the breakfast prepared on the table and asked, did she prepare it? Zayoi confirmed his words with a satisfied expression. He was surprised and said, but she is only five years old, and she already knows how to cook. He sat down opposite her, and she asked him sadly how he was feeling. He smiled and replied that everything was fine, after which he began to eat breakfast. When he tried the noodles, he was pleased that it was very tasty and showed her class. She asked him to eat quickly, otherwise there is a high chance of being late for school. He replied before he could chew his food that if his brother went to school, then he would take care of her. He understood that he definitely needed to take care of her. Suddenly, he noticed how her lips began to tighten, and tears gradually appeared in her eyes. He turned to her and asked what happened. She answered, looking into his eyes, that she could take care of herself, and she didn't want her brother to get tired. Otherwise, he would hate her in the future and drive her away from here. He patted her head again and asked her not to worry, because her brother would never hate her. She cried again, and he silently looked at her sad appearance, after which he raised his palms and said with a smile, Okay, he promises to go to school. He gives up. She was delighted and replied that in that case, she would go get her brother's coat. After school, Nuo found himself in front of a lot of bicycles, and something alarmed him. He started screaming angrily, How terrible! Where's his bike? His bike was not in the parking lot where he left it. Chen Nuo walks dissatisfied and approaches the guard booth. Approaching the man, he loudly shouts that his bike was stolen. But the bald man wearily looks up at him and asks in bewilderment, What? Nuo gets upset and after a pause says, He understood everything, he will look for it on his own. After a while, he rolls the bike while holding the handlebars with his hand and says contentedly, It took him a long time to find it. But then he leaves the bicycle near a lamppost, tying the wheel with a chain, and goes to a nearby store. Coming out of this and holding a bottle of milk in his hand, he noticed that two gangster-looking guys approached his bike. They stopped and looked around carefully. Then the man shouted to the cap to quickly take off the chain while no one was around. When they got on the bike and rode away, Chen Nuo looked at their back and noted that this was interesting. Tangzi Street was quite crowded. Two men holding bikes walked through the gate, above which hung a large inscription. Nuo exactly following them with a smile realized that this is the truth here. Tangzi Street is the most famous street for selling used cars. They walked into the courtyard and greeted a bald, middle-aged man. He crossed his arms and held a cigarette in his teeth and asked, Do they have a new product? The man in the cap, pointing at the bike, explained that it is completely new. He can even smell the fresh smell of oil that has not yet dissipated. But he incredulously asked where he found it. Another guy with disheveled hair reassured him, The boss doesn't have to worry. It's far from their area. Then the bald man, opening the clutch that he had been holding under his arm all this time, agreed, okay, he will accept it at the market price. But the bandit pitifully reminded me that the bike is brand new. Maybe it will improve a little. But he handed him two bills and said, he must stop talking nonsense. Suddenly Chen Nuo knocked on the gate. The man shouted furiously why he was knocking here. What is he doing here? Nuo replied that he wanted to ask something. But he waved him off with his hand again and said displeasedly, about what? He should leave here and ask somewhere else. Then he sighed and threw off the chain, which at one end fell to the ground. Chen Nuo pushes the gate and goes inside, closing it. The man again menacingly asks, what is the baby looking for here? Nuo repeated, smiling slyly, he wants to ask something. Where is his safe? The bold man began to tell him that his name was Wu Dale, he had been in prison for many years. In his youth, he was sentenced to two years in prison for fighting and mutilation, but was released six months early for good behavior. While serving his sentence, he was lucky enough to meet an influential man. After his release from prison, with his support, he expanded his trade in used cars at the market and sold stolen goods. Over the years, Daly learned to earn money and stopped being good and kind. He's ruthless now, so the guy needs to get out of here. With these words, he takes the wrench in his hands and jumps forward, but Nuo has already managed to entangle his leg in the chain. When Wu Dalai notices this, Chen Nuo tightly grasps the other end of the chain and pulls forward. He screams in pain, he will break his legs. 
Tears begin to flow from his eyes, and he falls to the ground from sharp pain. As soon as Nuo approaches him, holding a red screwdriver, he immediately shouts that the money is in the locker. He smiles sweetly back and says that's good. Soon he, also holding a clutch with money, counts large bills and goes out of the gate. Daly, still lying on the ground and gritting his teeth, says, It can't be. Then he picks up the phone and calls and shouts into the phone to the interlocutor where he is. He must return immediately. They were robbed. Nuo approaches the nearest street cafe and, sitting down at a table, asks the owner to give him fried meat dumplings and wantons, small dumplings in broth. Having opened a bag filled with money, he mentally calculated, here it's about 40,000 to 60,000, he didn't come there in vain. After a few minutes he was enjoying his meal, when suddenly a gray car stopped at the iron gate. Several people ran out from there and immediately headed into the yard. Chen Nuo, noticing them, smiled and got up from the table and turned to the owner again. There were eight donuts left, so he would like the owner to pack them and give them to him. Men running up to Wu Dale shouted in fear, What's wrong with the boss? He stood up heavily and groaned in pain. Two people immediately held his hands and he ordered to find the guy. They must find and bring him. He will tear him to pieces and kill him. While beads of sweat were dripping from his face, he thought, Sixty thin. This guy stole sixty thousand. He earned it in two days on motorcycles. One of the bandits immediately asked what that guy looked like. Daly answered irritably, he is just a stupid child. He was a young guy with an ordinary appearance. Then the man clarified, does he stagger when walking? He turned his head to the sides in confusion and answered, yes, right. But how does he know? The guy pointed forward and asked, isn't it him? Wu Dale frowned and shouted, why did he come back? Nulo, smiling like crazy, explained that he didn't say that he left. His bike was still there. He was just going out to eat. Daly heard this and said in fear, unbelievable. Then he pointed at him and shouted to his subordinates, Go ahead. They should do whatever they want, but they are obliged to kill him. They must lock the gates. Under no circumstances should he run away. He has money. Law looked at them boldly and smiled weakly. The gate slammed shut and he found himself surrounded by five bandits. The guy with blue hair took a step forward and, holding a wrench in his hand, swung at him, shouting that he was going to die. Chen Nuo grabbed his wrist and twisted his arm to the side and hit him so hard that his arm broke. The guy fell to the ground groaning and in pain. Watching this, Wu Dale realized that he was a real guru. Nuo took the wrench and headed boldly forward. Daily frightenedly shouted to the other guys to attack him. Ten seconds later the men were lying on the ground, and he, with a large bruise on his head and a bruise around his eye, despite them, thought that they had already given up and didn't even scratch him. This stupid guy is too good to fight. After he turned to Chen Nuo and explained, he realized that he was strong. It was a misunderstanding, okay? But he sat in front of him on a wooden chair and crossed his legs and did not agree no. He knows that he did not come to terms with this. It's better to deal with the whole situation now so he doesn't have to hire people to find him later. He will give him time for Wu Dale to gather his people, but at the same time he will not budge. How is this an option for him? He fell to his knees and cried loudly, he was wrong, he was wrong. He can run away, but Nuo will still find him. He will stop running his business, he gives up. Will he let him go? He took the money and put everyone away. He can take his bike. He really asks for it. Chen Nuo, listening to him, smiled slightly and hinted, he was tired of riding a bicycle, he should find him something. Daily immediately agreed, okay, okay, as long as the guy is merciful, he will guarantee that he will be satisfied. Standing up and pointing his hand to the side, he explained that he took it last week. It was completely redone and repainted. This motorcycle is an RB product from a well-known company. He made a jet exhaust pipe with his own hands. Wu Dale folded his hands in a prayer gesture and asked with a smile, Is the guy happy? Chen Nuo said thoughtfully after a pause for a while, But he doesn't have a helmet. Daly shouted in response, There is, everything is there. Then handing him a black helmet with red stripes, he explained, It is made of carbon fiber, anti-fog glass. He didn't plan to sell the bike when he stole it, so he left it. He's never ridden one before, so the guy can enjoy the rides. Nuo, taking the helmet in his hands, agreed. This is quite reasonable. It's okay to forgive him at first, but he has one flaw. He hates bald people. What's the point of pretending to be a ruthless bald man? What does he do when he sees children on the street? Wu Dale cried again out of resentment and explained he didn't shave. His hair naturally falls out. The sunset sky is painted in beautiful pastel shades. Nuo is racing on a motorcycle along the road. 
Suddenly, he spots Sun Kika ahead and immediately hits the brake, turning the motorcycle sideways and stopping right in front of her. To which she screams in fear, what is he doing? She told him that this was the entrance to the school. She might scream, but he took off his helmet and replied, she can scream. Cake took his helmet in her hands and asked in shock, is it him? Where did he get this motorcycle from? He only replied that she should wear this one. Before her father finishes work, he will take her home. But she asked him in disappointment, should he ride on such a cold day? Chen Nuo suddenly noticed something on her jacket and commented, this brooch is very beautiful. But she clenched her fists and angrily exclaimed where he was looking. He calmly asked where she got it from. Sun Keek explained that it was her mother's friend who gave it to her. Two days ago, her mother took her to dinner with her friends. There was a man at the table who gave her this. Nuo clarified, it's expensive, isn't it? But she only said that this pin was not worth a lot of money. Mom also agreed to accept this gift. Chen Nuo thought, neither she nor her mother knows that it is from a famous French jewelry company. In their time, when the average salary is a couple of hundred yuan, does a price in five figures mean nothing? Afterwards, he pulled out a package from the inside pocket of his jacket and said, okay, she can forget about it. If she doesn't want to ride, then she can take this. Cake looked in surprise at the unknown object wrapped in a bag and asked what it was. But he just took the helmet and winked and wished her bon appetit. She watched him drive away and, opening the package, saw the container. Sun Keek, embarrassed, realized that these were buns. He covered them to keep them warm. On the other side, in Seoul, Li Guang stood at home in front of the mirror and practiced pronouncing words that in Chinese are similar in pronunciation to others, sign, goose, leg, hard plum, she is very happy, come, arrive, betray. Sign, goose, leg, hard plum, she is very happy, come, interrupt, traitor. Repeating this, she confidently said, she welcomes everyone, her name is Ing Van, she is very glad to come here. The boy leans his ear to the door and listens to what Li Guan says. Turning to his mother, he clarifies, does she really want his sister to go abroad and study in Jiangning? The woman, sitting in a chair holding a mug in her hands, answered, this is his sister's wish. For the good of their family, her sister must find a boyfriend. Sun Kik approaches the director's office, holding a package in his hands. At this time, Sun Xingli is sitting at the table and working with documents. She entered the office and approached him and gently said, Dad, he shyly rubbed the back of his head and noted that these days he was busy distributing classes for the new semester. So he asked her to bring him dinner every day. She handed him the package with a smile and replied, he should eat quickly, everything is fine. Afterwards, she took him by the arm and led him to the sofa and with a slight laugh asked him to sit down and eat and she would sit in his place and be in charge here. He looked at her in confusion and exclaimed, she's just like a boss. Having settled down at the table, Keek watched Shenley with regret. Suddenly her hands landed on a stack of papers on the table, and she pushed several sheets to the side, took a pen and wrote something down. Sighing heavily, she looked at the list of sixth grade students, where two names were written next to her in her hand, Chen Nuo and hers. When the frosty evening arrived, the children were leaving the school building. The girl waved to her two friends and said joyfully, they will see Mei Mei and Jingjing Jing next year. The girl with the yellow jacket waved back and said, sure. Another friend behind me added, yes. She hopes they will be in the same class. At the same moment, the boy hugged his friend over his shoulder and joyfully said, finally they have winter holidays. At least they'll have a little fun. The guy in sportswear with a scarf agreed, maybe they could go to an internet cafe today. At Sun Kik's home, Shingli, sitting on the sofa next to Chen Nuo, noted that his exam results this semester were not bad. He was looking forward to his further success in the new semester. He remembers how he copied everything from a classmate and embarrassedly straightens his hair and says, of course. Sun Shingli adds, by the way, he heard that Nuo took his sister home. Is it true? How did he do it? He is still young. He has to go to school. How will he take care of the child? Then Nuo replied that he could skip classes. He, dissatisfied with this answer, began to wonder whether it was appropriate to say such a thing in the presence of the director. Afterwards, he asks if the child should go to kindergarten. Wasn't he told this? He is too busy with his own affairs. If he wants to raise her, he must figure everything out. Chen Nuo listens to him and thinks, when Dong Huo and the others were brought up in a past life, there was no kindergarten. They were all raised on the streets. There is a knock on the door and Shanley, turning to Keek, explains that it's mom who has returned. She gets up from her chair and, opening the door, greets her, mom. The woman hands her the bag and looks ahead. 
Sun Shingly stands up and introduces her to Nuo. To him, she is just young. He greets her politely. He is glad to meet you. Shanley then explains to her that this is his student. Also greets him. After collecting her hair in a ponytail, she explains that she will go wash off her makeup and prepare dinner. After a while, in the new semester on Friday morning, Chen Nuo held Chen Zaioi's hand and stood in front of the kindergarten gate. The children, sitting on the ground, cried and screamed loudly, they want to go to their mothers. They want to watch TV. He looked at them and then looked down at Zaioi, who was trembling with fear, and explained that from now on she will stay here from Monday to Friday, and on the weekends he will take her home. She will need to get used to it. She chuckles with tears in her eyes and clarifies, Will her brother really come for her on weekends? Nuo, stroking her cheek, replied, of course. He will come right after school and pick her up. After that, he heads to school and stopping at the entrance to the office, he saw students playing and noted that he had come to the wrong class. But looking at the sign next to the door, he thinks, he almost forgot, classes are being disbanded in the new semester. It's not surprising that many new faces have appeared. As he walks inside, he is spotted by a red-haired girl who giggles happily and joyfully announces, Chen Nuo has arrived. Sun Keek, who was standing next to her, embarrassedly shouts that she shouldn't make noise. The lesson will start soon, she should return to her place. The cheerful laughter of their classmates can be heard around them. Nuo throws his backpack on his desk, and Keek notices this. She turned around in surprise and clarified, is he sitting here? He asks her in response, but on the contrary. The school bell rings and Sun Shingly enters the office. Put him in the pulpit, he announces. From now on, he will be their homeroom teacher until they graduate from school. Then he says loudly, Chen Nuo. He raises his hand and answers, yes. Shanley points to the very last desk in the row and explains that he must sit there. This semester the teachers will take good care of him and keep an eye on him, so he shouldn't try to cheat. Nuo, packing his backpack to the laughter of his classmates, thinks that in reality everything is not like that. When he goes to the indicated place, the student, who, hiding behind a textbook, reads the book with hope, thinks he should not approach him, should not do this. He doesn't want to be involved in everything that happens. He just wants to continue reading the novel. Chen Nuo sits down, and the guy turns to him with hope and asks, he's talking to the most beautiful girl in the class, he shouldn't mock him. Lo, seeing his book, clarifies, is this book called In Search of Peace? He likes Jin Yong's novel called The White Horse and The Whistle of the West Wind. The phrase is all very good, but he doesn't like it, attracts people to read the novel. Luo King, putting the book down on the table, joyfully exclaims, yes, he sees that Law is just like him. After school, Chen Nuo walked to the kindergarten gate. The teacher extended her hand to Zaioi and told her not to rush, but to be careful, otherwise she might fall. As soon as she saw Nuo, she stretched her arms forward and screamed, brother. With tears in her eyes, she ran up and hugged him, sobbing loudly. He immediately frowned and clarified, did someone offend her? But she wiped the tears from her eyes and explained, no, and it was very scary. She was afraid that he would not come for her. Patting Chen Zaioi's cheek, he cheerfully exclaimed, how can this happen? Putting her on the bike, he added, now her brother is going to feed her. She, holding the steering wheel with her hands, clarified, are they going to his classmate? Chen Nuo asked in surprise, how did she know this? She answered confidently, but she likes him. Hearing this, he exclaimed, how can children understand such things? Nuo suddenly breaks suddenly when he sees Luo King and Sun Keek nearby, waving to him. She joyfully shouts to him that they are here. He approaches them and thanks King. He returns the bike to him. He looks down and frowns and asks, is this his little sister? Sitting down slightly, he hands her a chocolate bar and says tenderly, she can take this. He is her brother's friend. She can call him king. Zaioi looks up at Chen Nuo, who nods and explains that she can eat. Zaioi, stretching out her hands to the chocolate bar, joyfully says, King. He touchingly turns to Nuo, his sister is so sweet. If he had seen her earlier, he would have asked his parents for a sister. But his father spent half his life earning money. He did not marry for a long time, and therefore he was born late. Then they were 40 years old, and now they are already 57. Chen Nuo answers with understanding, even if a son appeared in old age, he is still a father. Keek suddenly looks at them with a pitiful look and announces that it was originally decided that Nuo would invite Zaioi to dinner tonight, but it turns out that her father is working overtime again. I heard that the education department will come from the inspection next Monday, so they will eat another day. 
After listening to her, Luo King exclaimed joyfully, Great, he's bored sitting at home alone, so they can go play in the arcade together. There is a new restaurant in Dongshan, and next to it, there is a fast food place. They will all eat together after having a good time. Soon they approach the gaming club. King, handing Nuo a small container of snacks and pointing his hand back, explains that he is going to play a speed game the three of them can play at this time. Chen Nuo, taking the container from him, shows an excellent sign and thinks, this is male friendship. Sun Keek points to the slot machine nearby and happily says, they can go play basketball. He agrees and explains, okay, he'll go to the toilet for now, she can play with his sister. After that, he leaves, when suddenly Zio Dao and his company enter the room. The blonde man, holding him by the shoulder, laughingly asks, is he drunk? But he responds with an exclamation, he can have fun, his friend pays for everything. He had his cast removed this morning, and they came right over to celebrate. But suddenly one of his friends with freckles points his finger forward and asks Dao to look who is there. He brings his eyebrows to the bridge of his nose and shouts, who is this? But looking ahead, he sees Keek throwing a basketball into the basket. Chuckling disgustingly and smiling widely, he says, Today is truly a great day. Chen Nuo returns from the toilet and sees a group of guys surrounding Sun Keek, who is covering Zaioi with one hand, while she looks at him with big eyes and shouts, Brother. Nuo comes closer and puts his hand on Zio Dao's shoulder and asks if he recently left the hospital. He, not seeing his interlocutor, turns and shouts, The guy is blind. Can't he really see? But turning around, he freezes and falls silent, looking at Nuo in fear. But the guy next to him does not calm down and shouts at him that he must get out of there. His friend is talking to his daughter-in-law. Where did he even come from? Is he running into trouble? Suddenly, Luo King squeezes between the guys, clenching his fist and shouting furiously, who is trying to cause trouble for his other. Turning to Nuo, he adds that he need not be afraid. Then he turns to the others and asks again, who is asking for a fight here? The guy with freckles, continuing to point his finger at him, answers as he sees, he is the first to start a fight. After that, he raises his flank to strike. King shouts to him, he can come. His father Luo Dejin. Now they will see which of them is stronger. Hearing this name, they freeze in place and Zio Dao clarifies, is he Dejin's son? Then he just misunderstood. He and his classmate were just chatting. Today they met with boss Luo. They are leaving now. But Luo King does not calm down and shouts loudly, someone is going to beat him, Hulu doesn't care. The big guy who was sitting at the table at that moment, playing cards, asked in surprise, what? But then he stands up and shouts loudly, King. He walks through a crowd of people and asks, what's the matter? Luo King, pointing at Dao, says that this guy said that he wants to deal with him. Frightened, he immediately exclaims, what? He didn't say that. The real criminal behind him turns his head to the side, pretending he didn't say anything. Hulu grabs him by the throat, but Zio Dao keeps repeating, he didn't say that, this is true. Without listening to him, he gives him a strong slap in the face. Then he begins to hit him on the cheeks, causing his head to spin in different directions. Dao, rubbing his bruised face, repeats, he did not say that he wanted to deal with Liuo King. But he hits him again and Zio Dao says, he was wrong, he said that he met with boss Liuo. Hulu throws him to the ground exclaiming, he is worthless, how could he see his boss? Dao, rising to his feet, sobbing and holding his sore cheek with both hands, repeated his apologies, he was mistaken, he was wrong, he must be forgiven. Chen Nuo, standing to the side, closed Zayoi's eyes and thought mockingly, this is too cruel. Hulu speaks loudly to King and asks what will he say. He covers his mouth with one hand and shows a diminishing gesture with the other, explaining that this is enough. Then he kicks Dao in the blonde, who is holding his arm, shouts for them to get out of here. Finally waving to Luo King, he added, he needs to go, but if anything happens, he can call him. King also waved back and said with a smile, okay. But when he turns around, he sees behind him how Nuo and Keek are silently looking at him. He explains without smiling that he forgot to say, this gaming room was opened by his father. Chen Nuo noted quite well, it seems he has rich parents, the heir to the boss of the underworld. But he is in a good mood, and they will answer, he is not the heir yet. Usually he does not ask his father for this, but if someone offends his friend, then it is better for this person to lie low as quickly as possible. Nuo nods and thanks him in response. He then notes that he didn't expect his friend to be Luo Dejin's son. Luo King leaned towards Chen Zaioi and said softly, she is hungry, so he will take her to a fast food restaurant. 
Newell continued to think. For him, who lives in Jinling, the name Dajin is familiar from childhood. As a child, he was a worker, unloading sand at a state-owned factory. He later made a fortune and became popular in his city, working in the underworld to build a small family business. Sooner or later, everything had to pay off. But his life ended sadly. The Luo family could probably enjoy life for another year or two. Walking behind King, Chen Nuo kept thinking, this guy is quite down to earth and reserved. He enjoys reading novels and has a laid-back demeanor. At this moment, Luo King was carrying Zai Oi in his arms, who, having agreed to go eat, joyfully shouted to him, they can go. In the evening, when the lights in some of the windows had already gone out in the apartment building, Sun Keek and Nuo, together with Chen Zai Oi, stood near the front door. Cake knocked on the door and asked her father to open it. But when there was silence in response, she inserted the key into the keyhole and said excitedly, strangely, the light in the school office is not on. Her father is not at home. Where could he go? Chen Nuo thought about it and his friend said, he wants to ask her for something. He needs to go somewhere tonight. He can't leave his sister alone. Could she please put her down and take care of her? Cake asked in surprise, what? Where did he go so late? but he just sighed and asked her not to ask about it. Handing over to Zaioi, who was already asleep in his arms, he explained that he would pick her up tomorrow morning. After that, he went along the corridor. Soon he stood in front of the office building thinking, now is the time to finish work. Sun Shingli must be nearby. Having been in front of the building for some time, he suddenly heard a noise and turned around. Looking ahead carefully, Chen Nuo noted with a frown that it was a black car. Shanli came out of this, lighting a cigarette. At the same moment, the glass door of the office opened, and Yao Weishan came out, accompanied by two security guards. The doorman politely said after him that he wished him a pleasant journey. Sun Shingli saw them and came closer. Suddenly, one of the men turned to him and shouted menacingly what he was doing. But Weishan raised his hand and explained that the guard should allow the man to pass. Nuo watched him interact with Shenli and wondered what he was doing here. Sun Shingli shows Yao Weishan the briefcase and asks him to take it but he waves his hand and throws it aside and shouts in displeasure. A lot of bills fall out of the bag, which he walks past and says with disgust, this is trash. Shenli, starting to collect money, clenches his teeth and screams, he gave him everything, how dare he do this? But when he turns around, the black car is already driving away. Then he sits down on the ground, surrounded by white bills. At that moment, Young approaches him on a bicycle. She immediately throws it on the road, and approaching him regretfully says, Sun Shingli. He looks at her, picks up all the money, and closes the bag. Rising to his feet, he said contemptuously, Zaioi should see what she has done. Suddenly, he swings sharply at her and repeats what she has done. But Young Zaioi only closed her eyes tighter, and without turning away added, he should hit her. Suddenly, his hand trembled, and he let it go with a sigh of regret. She grabbed his palm with both hands and sincerely said, looking into his eyes, he should listen to her. This is her mistake. It's all her fault. They should go home and talk. Then they go home together in silence. Chen Nuo, watching them, thinks Shingli gave Weishan money. It seems that something is not as he expected. A couple of days later, on a cloudy Monday near the school, a man pointing at a large red banner behind him and holding a bullhorn in his hand shouts loudly, if Principal's son does not pay his debts, then he is not worthy of being a teacher. Schoolchildren standing near the fence whisper excitedly. Nuo squeezes between them and asks to be allowed to pass. Sun Keek listens carefully to the man, then puts his hands to his face and says in horror, How is this possible? Chen Nuo approaches her, looking at the agitator with disbelief. Suddenly Shanley also comes towards them from behind and, approaching the guy who grins smugly, irritably says, Why are they doing this? He will return the money. He needs two more days. Why did they make such a fuss? After handing him a diplomat, he explained that this is all he has. First, the man can take this money. This is a school. They must not disturb the order here. He can take the money and leave. The man, looking into the bag, replied that they didn't want this either, but the director must pay off his debt. After that, he calls out to the guys who are holding the banner. They can go. Next time, they will arrive in two days. Kick screams in fear, Dad. Dad. Chen puts his arm around her shoulders and looks at her with regret, then turning around notes that the director must not have wanted his daughter to see something like that. Sun Shingli leaves and tells everyone to stop just watching. Now is the lesson, they must return to their places. The students disperse indignantly, what kind of arrogance. 
First of all, people always pay attention to a person's reputation. He turns out to be a real freak. He was driven straight to school for debts. What a mess he made on the street. Sun's teacher maintained his reputation as a teacher all his life. And now, the world that belonged to him has collapsed. There are a small number of students in the class, and there are many empty seats visible. Luo King turns to Nuo and whispers, What's wrong with Keek? He finds out that the director said that he would go to sort out his affairs. It's better for her to go with her father. Now the atmosphere here is tense. It's better for her not to stay in school. Then he adds, could King show him two services? He immediately agrees he will do anything. Then Chen Nuo asks him to help him find out who the person is who came to collect the debt. Even if they are moneylenders, it shouldn't be that difficult. His father's company are probably familiar with them. He has to help him figure out which one of them did it, okay? Liuo King readily replies, it's not difficult, call his brother later and ask. But why is he asking for this? Does he want to help the director? Why? Nuo, smiling, briefly replies that he will help him return the money. King clarifies with suspicion, okay, what about the second service? He smiles, and with a sweet smile asks to cover him in class, and say that he is just playing truant. With these words, he gets up from behind the party and adds that he will return. Passing by, placing his hand on Luo King's shoulder, he adds that after he has done everything, he should send him a message. Further, Chen Nuo leaves the classroom with a determined look. An hour later, riding a motorcycle to a dilapidated building, he thinks Luo King can handle everything very quickly. Getting off the motorcycle and heading towards the stairs, he said, Guohua Financial Company is located on the third floor. Nuo stopped in front of the door, near which hung the sign of a financial company, and knocked. It opened and a guy with piercings appeared on the threshold, who, resting one hand on a bucket, asked what was the matter. Chen Nuo, without taking off his helmet, explained that he was looking for someone. He frowned and asked who. Nuo, looking at him carefully through his helmet, said, him. After this, he kicks the man in the stomach, causing him to scream in pain and fly deeper into the room, falling onto the table and breaking it. He goes inside and turns to the other guys and tells them if they have knives or guns, they can take it. Although they may forget about this proposal, they probably don't even have a knife. But they must resist as hard as possible. He is in a lousy mood now, so he wants to throw out all his anger. A guy in a tracksuit rushes at him screaming, he's an idiot. Chen Nuo raises his hand and, starting to run forward, knocks him down, throwing him into the closet. Then he takes the hot kettle that was standing on the corner of the table, and splashing boiling water on it, he exclaims, he is so dirty, so he must wash himself. The guy groans in pain. Then Nuo, winding a metal chain around his palm, adds that it was rather weak, he should do it even more actively. The rest of the guys arm themselves with metal sticks and knives. Walking towards him, they shout, go ahead, and so... They must grab all the weapons. But a couple of minutes later, Chen Nuo stood surrounded by guys who were scattered around the room along with broken things. Taking the red-haired man by the hair, which screamed in pain, he headed towards the wooden chair. Having sat down, Law announced that if he understood everything correctly, then he should be in charge here. He knows he's not the boss. But he will ask him a couple of questions, and the guy better answer honestly. He hates it when people lie. If someone lies, he gets very angry. Does the guy understand this? He looked at him with bruises on his face and quietly replied that he understood everything. Suddenly Chen Nuo breaks his little finger, causing tears to appear in the red-haired guy's eyes. He explains this was the first question, and he is not satisfied with his answer. He speaks too quietly. With these words, he tightly squeezes his little finger and the guy screams again. Nuo, pleased with the result, says that this is already better, now he can be heard well. They should continue, what's his name? The red-haired guy immediately answers, his name is Kui Daipenji. Chen Nuo takes his ring finger and asks again, has he ever done anything wrong? Daiping doesn't dare answer, so he breaks his second finger. His screams are heard, and he answers, yes, he did bad. He served three years in prison. Nuo clarifies why. Kui Daping has tears flowing from his eyes and explains he ran away people, he was hurting them. Then Chen Nuo says contentedly, well, as he can already see, they have begun to understand each other. Well, they should continue. Do they have a safe here? He repeats stutteringly, they have it, they have it. Nuo hands him a sports bag and explains that he must fill the backpack with money. If he does not fill this one to the top, then he will cut it into pieces. Soon the bag was full of bundles of money. 
Chen Nuo took this thoughtfully and said a saying, meaning extorting the property of the rich, like draining people because they are rich. This is a good fight against the wind. Approaching Daping, he announces the last question. Where is all the information about their clients and somehow theirs stored? He sits on the floor and begins to sob loudly and asks for forgiveness. He can't say it. The boss will kill him. But as soon as Lo grabs him by the injured hand, he points to the closet and explains, he will say everything. Documents are stored on the second shelf. He looks there and, throwing aside the unnecessary piece of paper, leaves a blue folder in his hands and opening it, carefully reading the information, he exclaims he found it. Tucking it under his jacket, Chen Nuo happily notes that he did it. A lit lighter turns over several times in the air and falls into a plate with papers. The blonde lying on the ground shouts to him, does he even know who his boss is? If he reveals information about clients, he will cross the path of the boss, there will be no turning back. Nuo, looking at him over his shoulder, clarifies who their boss is. The guy answers, Zayo Guohua. After that he asks if the blonde knows who he is. The guy looks at him and thinks, he's wearing so many clothes, how can you find out who? Suddenly Chen Nuo stretched out his hand to him and sternly orders him to give him the phone. Law locks the doors of the financial company with a metal chain and throws all the phones out the window. After that, he walks down the corridor and repeats the name in his head, Zayo Guohua. That same evening in one of the grill bars in Guohua, held by a blonde man in a formal suit, he walked along the corridor and thought, what happened? Who is so brave? Xiaoming? Fu Daking. What he does is none of his business, it doesn't interest him. The man politely asks if he can walk President Zayo to the car, but he only rudely tells him that this is not required. Then he continues to think that it's probably a matter of foreign products. He doesn't know where this Guo Janglu, that is, the ruthless person who commits a crime, has gone. In his time, he won a lucky ticket and became rich. If he covets his property, then he will have to meet him in person. He remembers how he ordered his subordinates to gather all the people they could. Even if everything needs to be turned upside down, they must find him. The men answered in unison, they understood everything. Zayo Guohu walked up to the car, got in, closed the door, and put his bag next to it on the seat. He then orders his driver Lao Wai to go home. Closing his eyes, he falls asleep. Ten minutes later, he suddenly opens his eyes and asks what. Looking out the window, Guohua realized, this is not the way home. He takes a lighter and, while lighting a cigarette, asks the driver if he would like a cigarette. But Chen Nuo, driving the car, replies, he is driving, he will smoke later. Then Zayo Guohua opens the window and throws out the cigarette and wonders where they are going. After counting the money in the bag, he asks if the guy wants to earn more money or if he has any difficulties. Here he has a considerable sum, he has a lot to do, so it's better for them to be friends, and this is help to his comrade. Throwing one of the money wads into the front seat, he explains that if there is something the guy can't handle, then he should just say so. He has good influence in these parts. But you shouldn't take rash actions, does he agree with this? Nuo looked at him through the rearview mirror and said, he talks too much on the road. Suddenly Guo Hua thought in horror, he thought it was a robbery. But he knew who he was. Did the guy really come for him? After that, he got scared, but trying not to show it, he said, it's not worth it. If he can do something for him, then he can just say it. Chen Nuo says, without taking his eyes off the road, it is not surprising that he is easy to negotiate with. That's not bad, then he has some questions. Zayo Guohua puts his hand under his jacket and thinks, things are bad, this is all not good. Nuo warns him he better not try to call anyone. He immediately puts the phone back and replies that that's what he says. Why does he hate him? What happened? Nuo slams on the brakes and the car stops in the middle of the mountains. Turning to him, he explains that it seems to him that now they can talk. He should let him smoke. Turning the rearview glass and lighting a cigarette, Chen Nuo notes that Boss Zayo has been busy with business lately. Heard that he raised a child in Yinsang, and last year he had another one. Hearing this, Guo Hyo freezes in surprise and tries to answer cheerfully. He spins like a squirrel in a wheel. Nuo explain if he is tired, he can take a vacation. He need not worry about business. He can take a couple of days off to spend this time with his wife and son. He agrees, and really, does he think a month's vacation will be enough? But Chen Nuo replies that the boss earns gold every day. A month of downtime will greatly affect income. Two weeks. He heard that it is quite warm in Southeast Asia now. Zayo Guohua immediately agrees, yes. He will ask that he have a plane ticket booked for tomorrow, and that he will take his family to Thailand on an excursion. 
Nuo exhales smoke and says, it was a wise decision. Now he can go out, he won't take him back. Along with his words, the lock on the door clicks and opens. Guo Hua immediately gets out of the car adding, good. The guy doesn't have to worry and leaves the car. Watching Chen Nuo leave, he sighs with relief. Suddenly looking to the side, he notices a shovel and an excavated hole in the ground. Turning around, Zayo Guo Hua screams, it can't be. If he had responded to the dacha, he could have ended up there already. After that, he calls on the phone and shouts to the interlocutor that he should not leave the house. Also, he should not ask anything. He should call his people and stop talking nonsense. Oh, he should no longer look for it, but carry out tasks. And also, he must book a ticket for him. He goes to Thailand for 14 days. And for the rest, he must book tickets too. What about business? He will leave it for a few days. No one will die. What is this word called? That's right, team building. What? He doesn't know what teamwork is. Late in the evening at the supermarket, Lion approaches the checkout with a large package and looks at the yellow card, notes that Chen Nuo did not take his card to go to Yanbin, now it may come in handy for him. The cashier girl swipes the cards through the machine and explains that there are not enough funds on his card. Handing her a bill, he replies he knows, it seems that six yuan will be enough, yes, that's enough cash. But then the girl explains that he is missing 504 yuan and two cents. Hearing this amount, and exclaims in bewilderment, What? How much money is on this card? She clarifies that the balance is 80 cents. After that, he leaves the store with a small package and thinks in bewilderment, Nuo. But looking ahead and noticing the man, he thinks, Sun Shingli. Why did he come to the hotel late at night? Did he really rent a number? He can't even imagine what this man is going to do. Turning away, he thinks irritably, He's already had enough and doesn't want to meddle in other people's business. But suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he notices someone and says out loud, This is Chen Nuo. I think he just saw it. But looking at the closed doors of the hotel, he thinks, maybe he just imagined it. The door of the VIP room opens, and Yao Weishan, sitting at the table and holding a cigarette in his teeth, says, Is this Shingli? He can sit down. He passes and frowns and says, Weishan. Sitting down at the table, he asks displeasedly, Who did he think he was, inviting him so late? He, throwing him a cigarette, says they haven't eaten at the same table together for several years. Sun Shingli says this while setting fire, more than ten years have passed since he left the country. He didn't even think that Yao Weishan would come back. He explains that he actually returned last year. Didn't Yang Zayoi tell him about this? He returned to invest in a project, and it so happened that he had business related to her work. But Shanley asks incredulously, did it happen? What a coincidence. Weishin agrees, well, ten years of friendship is not an empty phrase. He admits that he deliberately became interested in this project in order to meet Zayoi. Sun Shingli, not surprised, asks the question, does that mean he set up that trap? Was he just playing around and making her fall into his web? Ya yeah, Weishin says with a sly smile, he says it as if it's a punishment. He simply advised her to make a small financial investment and allowed her to earn some money. Shanley clarifies what then. He lowered his eyes and said that Yong Zaioi was very interested in this. He opened an account for her in another country to invest. He didn't think she seemed so brave and would invest so much money. The futures market is treacherous and unpredictable. She needs to be more careful. Suddenly Sun Shingli rises from her chair and hits the table with her hand and shouts, Is she brave? Or did he deliberately set it up? She doesn't understand futures, but he made a fortune out of her helped her open an account, and let her do everything on her own. This is a futures, market in another country. When she found that she could no longer bear it, she asked him for help. How did he save Zaioi? He used the joint account of the company he was investing in to withdraw hundreds of thousands. He did a good job. On behalf of the emergency fund, she could spend hundreds of thousands. But if she doesn't sign the papers, she won't be able to get the money. Now, from a financial point of view, Yang Zaioi is the payer. She signed the reserve and took it. She received money to cover the debt from futures. A year has passed, and suddenly his company decided to check the accounts. What company checks accounts only after a year? Weishin is doing everything possible just to destroy her. She is a little aggressive by nature, but she is not that brave. If he hadn't said that they had some insider winning information, she wouldn't have dared to throw away the money. She believed him. Yao Weishin puts out his cigarette and angrily explains that if there is no evidence, then everything is pointless. Why does he think she believed him? If she had followed him abroad ten years ago, things would have been different. He should listen to him, even he has those he can't refuse. Sun Shingli continues to shout, he shouldn't be such a scoundrel. 
she is now his wife. But Weishan, lighting a new cigarette, clarifies, thinks that we are talking about Yang Xiaoi. He is silent in response and screams again, holding out his hands to him. What is he saying like that? But after that, sitting down on a chair, he sadly says, this cannot be. Yao Weishan turns to him and explains that he said that Xingli is quite smart, but it is impossible to know everything in life. In fact, he had already understood everything a long time ago, but he never dared to think about it, right? He looks at him desolately and says, he shouldn't say such things. But he still continues, the year before last he was in another country. A friend from China sent him one photo. He can't deal with it anymore. They are related by blood. Neither he nor son Xingli chose this. Does he think that he was talking about Xiaoi before? Does he think that with his condition he lacks the attention of women? After getting up from the table and approaching him, Weishan adds that he didn't want to come back either. But a couple of years ago he got sick. After he got better, the doctor said that he could no longer have children. In medicine, this is called pathological sperm morphology. Shanley exclaims desperately, but this is his daughter. Yao Weishan also becomes indignant. Is this his daughter? He should look carefully. Does Keek look like him? As soon as he looked at the photo, he immediately realized that she was his daughter. He shouldn't lie. In the memories of Sun Xingli, moments emerge from his wedding with Yang Xiaoi when the guests joyfully congratulated them. He later remembers hugging her belly when she was pregnant. Xiaoi laughed at him embarrassedly and said that now he looks like a child. After that, memories pop up in his head about how the nurse, handing him the newborn son Keek, congratulated him on the birth of his daughter. Besides this, among the most memorable moments was the one when he rode off with her on a bicycle and joyfully said that today was her birthday, her mother had set the table so she should eat everything. Covering his face with his hands and biting his lip, Shanley continued to repeat, This is impossible, this is his daughter. Yao Weishan, towering over him and looking down, added, He knows that son Shingli thinks that she and her mother are destined for him. Xiaoi, seeing that the company wanted to check the accounts, panicked and said that they didn't even want to touch her. There was no money in the family for a long time, so they went and begged everywhere. They begged for more than 10,000. But this is not enough. On a loan, they can get 150,000, earn 300,000. But this is still not enough. Sun Shingli caught him last night and wanted to give him this insignificant amount, wanted him to settle all the affairs of the company. Does he think he will do it? Shanley, rising from his seat, shouts what he finally wants from him. Weishan explains that he needs Keek, Sun Shingli's daughter, no. It would be more correct to say that he needs his daughter. But he doesn't agree, it's impossible. He's gone crazy. Sun Keek is his daughter. He doesn't believe the nonsense that Yao Weishan says. He clarifies, laughing in his face, does he still not believe it? Maybe he should do a DNA test. He won't let him die happy. His time is almost up. Suddenly a woman enters the room and Shanley feels as if he is being shocked. Turning around, he sees Yang Xiaoi with tear-stained eyes, clutching a blue folder to her chest and saying in surprise, Sun Shingli. When Xiaoi entered the office and saw her husband, she dropped the documents. Weishan smiled and said, Great, now everything is assembled. He grabbed her hand and started screaming at her to tell Sun whose daughter Cake really is. She got angry, her face turned red with rage, and she screamed, Why is he doing this? She does not know. She doesn't know anything. Shingli stood up for his wife and shouted to Weishin to let her go. He looked at him in surprise. Shenli took another step and shouted again, hitting him in the face, that he told him to let his wife go. Weishin touched his cheek with his hand and said, Okay, he will forgive him for this slap. Since he raised his daughter for many years, but he doesn't care about himself. Shingli walked up to Zaioi with a frightened expression on his face and anxiously began to ask her questions. Can she say that Cake is his daughter? Is she really his daughter? Zaioi looked into his face with tears in her eyes, then fell to her knees in front of him and shouted for him to forgive her. When she married him, she was pregnant, but Weishin went abroad and left her, and she didn't know what to do. And then, but before she could finish speaking, Shingli added that then she found him. She continued to scream while sitting on the floor that son is a great husband and father. Let him forgive her, please. He said Weishin, frowning okay, he saw what he wanted. He won't give him either Zaioi or Keek, he shouldn't even hope for it. He grabbed his wife's hands, lifted her and said that they needed to go. But Weishin ordered him to stop and said with a menacing expression on his face that the settlement with the company would take place at the latest next week. If they go out the door now, he must be ready to the point that his wife will be arrested. 
He showed the card and said that there is a million on this card that can solve all their problems and with this money they can start all over again and he can take her to another country and send her to a prestigious school and give her a luxurious life. She can completely change her life. They only need to sign these three contracts, a certificate of paternity, a disclaimer of paternity, and an agreement to transfer custody. The couple stood and looked at him in shock as he continued to address the Shingli and said that he knew he was stubborn, but he should think about the decision. He gives them three days. He should think and find him, then they will sign contracts and he will give this money. Some time later, he was showering in the bathroom and laughing loudly because it was a wonderful night, better than four years ago. He will force them to act according to his knowledge and get his daughter. When he brings the keek, the days of Shingli will come to an end. He must get rid of all the weeds that are bothering him. He turned off the water and reached for a towel, and when he got out of the shower, he saw a new sitting in front of him, which is why he got scared and started screaming, Who is he? Nuo grinned and said good evening to him, and pointed the barrel of the gun at his body. Weishan got scared, put his hands in front of him, and asked in a trembling voice, Does he need money? They can discuss everything. Nuo stood up and answered, No, it's not money, he needs justice. Weishin was dumbfounded when he suddenly turned around and began screaming for help. Nuo used his magical powers, bright sparks burst out from his eyes, which enveloped Weishin's body and forced him to stop. He was dumbfounded and wondered what was going on. Why can't he move? He can't breathe. Nuo took him by the hand and told him that he would not be able to escape and should not waste his time. He snapped his fingers sharply. Weishin began to breathe loudly and grabbed his throat as the magic began to dissipate. He stopped and with tears in his eyes asked him who he was. It's magic? Magic? Nuo took a bottle of alcoholic drink from the bar and began to pour it into a glass, saying in response that he does not know. But he knows that he was unlucky. If he had not come into this world, his plan would have succeeded. He handed me a glass and said what he could drink. Weishin did this and Nuo said that now they will talk about song. Weishin started screaming in surprise. Was it really because of him that he came here? Because of this insignificant person, Nuo replied with a serious expression on his face that he had actually seen quite a lot of bad guys, and he was not the worst, but he was quite disgusting. Song is an ordinary person, and he never thought about hurting anyone. He will tolerate being offended because he just wants to live a peaceful life with his wife and daughter, but he wants to crush such an honest person to death, and it shouldn't be that way. Horrible. What happened to honest people? Is he ready to dig his own grave? Weishin, with a trembling voice, began to beg him to talk and said that he would definitely stop and not take the child. He swears that he will never provoke him again. He pressed the button on his mobile phone and shouted that he would immediately return to his home and prove it to him. He called Zhao's manager and said that they should cancel that company and he didn't need the payments, he had to do it immediately. After that, he put the phone away and said with a smile that he should look at it because he had already done everything. He let the Shingli family go. He doesn't need to kill him because he has a passport from another country and if he kills him, he will be in a lot of trouble. Nuo replied that all this is useless and he does not believe him because he knows bad guys like him too well because he used to be the same. He raised his finger up and Weishin scaredly asked him to stop after which tears flowed from his eyes and he again grabbed his throat asking him how he could kill him. He has a lot of money. Nuo stood over him and looked at the body sparkling with magical waves, saying that he took a hot shower and immediately drank strong alcohol, so that when they find him, they will think that it was an ordinary cerebral hemorrhage. Weishin's eyes had already rolled, and Nuo said that when he finds himself on the bridge between the world of the living and the dead, he should remember that in his next lives he does not need to intimidate honest people. On the second day, Nuo went outside and saw Song's bicycle in the parking lot. He sat down and wondered if Sun would forgive him for stealing the bike, but now he needs it more. He arrived at the daily store, who was relaxing on a sun lounger and smoking a cigarette, thinking that his right eye had been twitching all day. He suddenly jumped up from his seat when he saw the Nuo approaching and thought, what a horror. The red-haired guy greeted him and asked what he wanted. He threw his backpack on the table, took out a cigarette and a lighter, sat down on a comfortable chair in front of the TV, and said that he was very comfortable here. The guy shouted, pointing his finger at him, Where did he come from? Who does he think he is? Daly kicked him right in the back and shouted, How is he talking to his friend? He turned politely to the Nuo and asked what brought him here. He can take whatever he wants. Nuo replied with a smile that he didn't need anything and just wanted to sit here and wait for someone. 
He smiled and said that he could sit here and he would bring him longing tea. After some time, he handed him a mug and asked how he liked it. Nuo replied with a satisfied expression that this was quite good. Daly wondered who he had become. He turned into an errand boy. Suddenly Nuo drew attention to the entering Shenli, who was standing outside the gate and Nuo joyfully shouted to him, Son. Shenli was surprised by his presence here and asked why he was here. Did he skip class again today? He replied that he was working part-time to save money for his studies. This is his friend Dady. He is a very generous and sincere and kind person, so if he works with him, he will learn a lot. Daly looked at him questioningly, and Nuo, frowning with one glance, ordered him to follow this plan and Daly confirmed these words with a wide smile. Shanley replied that he was unlucky because he was a little hot-tempered and fidgety, so he needed to be taken care of. But if he doesn't obey, they can scold him. Daly silently and bewilderedly looked at Nuo, who was smiling into his eyes, and suddenly he asked Shenli if he had a bicycle. He scratched his cheek and replied that he lost his yesterday, and that's why he was here to find something cheap. Daly smiled and said that he had found the right person, and since they were already familiar with Chen Nuo, he would not bargain and would sell at a good price. The price of one of the bicycles was 280 yuan. Shanley replied with obvious discomfort that it was not bad, but could he give him a discount? Nuo turned to Song while standing near an expensive bicycle and asked, how about this for 80 yuan? Daly was completely dissatisfied with what was happening, but immediately extended his hand and said with joy, what 80? He will sell it for 50 yuan. Nuo asked him again, buddy, didn't he need to go to the financial company to check the accounts? He looked at him questioningly, after which the Nuo pointed his finger at him and said that his friend opened a financial company and began to engage in small lending business, he does not break the law. Shenli silently watched what was happening and then was surprised, does he have a lending business? Nuo mentally answered him, yes. Daly didn't understand what he came up with because he's a very bad actor and yet he changes the truth along the way. He came closer to Shenli and said, yes, he thinks that many people should conduct their business honestly, and he always talks about benevolence and righteousness. Shanley asked him if he could leave him his phone number. Perhaps this will be useful to him, he replied, of course. After Shenley bought the bike and rode out the gate, Daly turned to Nuo with a pleading expression on his face and asked if he did a good job and there are no problems. He replied that he thought people like him deserved to be rich in the future. After some time, they arrived at Dahl's office and his bedroom. He came closer and asked what was the matter. He was waiting for him. Nuo sat at the table on which he placed his backpack and began to open it. There were a lot of bills inside the backpack and Dolly screamed in fear. Where did he get so much money from? He doesn't kill people. That's not his business. Nuo said that he was not forcing him to do something like that. He just had to lend the old man's song 200,000 yuan since he wanted it. Daly replied that he understood everything. But what does he want to achieve? Get his house? Nuo hit him and said that he was talking like that. He just has to figure out how to give him the money. Daly was surprised and looked into the distance with a dumbfounded look while Nuo continued to say that the contract must be signed, otherwise he would not believe it. But the conditions were favorable and the interest rates were low. Payment in installments for 10 years or an 8-year contract he must come up with himself, but the conditions must be attractive so that he agrees to take the money, and then he will pay him back. Daly replied that he understood everything, he should not worry, but there was too much money. Nuo said that there were 300,000 yuan there. He returned more than 60,000 to him a couple of days ago, as well as a motorcycle. No matter how rich he is, a lot can be spent on medical expenses, and no matter how much money is required, he can spend it all on treating his hair. He can also correct his disastrous situation. Daly's eyes began to water heavily. He fell at the feet of the Nuo and shouted, Buddy, he's so kind. Everyone sees him as a ruthless person, only he saw the pain in his heart. Nuo got angry and asked him to stop slobbering on his pants. He stood up sharply and left the office, waved his hand further, and asked him to take care of himself and come more often. The guy with red hair turned to him in bewilderment and asked again who came today. He respects him as if he were older than him. He yelled at his employee that he was an asshole. He had met a real person and should be grateful for that. It is thanks to him that their store is still thriving and he helped his boss with a problem. Now he must take care of that man and then they can live happily ever after. Meanwhile, at the JN Investment Promotion Office, the secretary approached the director and said that she had in her hands a letter with an application for the project. The invested companies had been sent. He should look at it. 
He took it into his own hands and said that the conditions are very good and this is the key project of the current year. The task of attracting investment this quarter, if this is accomplished, they will be a winner. The secretary answered, but foreign businessmen made a request, saying that he is the child of the boss from the board of directors and wants to study here, so they are asked to solve the problem with enrollment, a student. The man replied that it is not difficult at all. People invest so much money to open a factory. This can solve the employment problem. You can also contact the Education Bureau and provide information about the best school children in the area so that foreign companies can choose. The secretary replied that they had already chosen the school they wanted to go to. He asked again, what is this? She answered, high school number eight. The director asked again, what place did this school take last year? She answered, third from the end. Jingling International Airport. A man with a suitcase in his hand left the airport and got into an arriving car. When he was inside, the girl in the front seat turned to him and said, Mr. Tiz Anderson, they will take him to the hotel first. He took off his glasses and said, no, let them take him to the police station. He wants to see the Yao Weishan case file as soon as possible. They must report the information to the headquarters. When he arrived at the hotel room, he called someone on the phone and said it was him. The hotel where Yao Weishan stayed is also recorded in the police file. They asked him again what he would do. He replied that the cause of death was an accident caused by excessive drinking after smoking. They told him that he needed to end this as soon as possible and not waste a lot of energy because he was just a rich man. Anderson responded that he felt there was something hidden in his death and he felt uneasy about it. He asks for further investigation. He needs two documents. These are credit card bills for the first six months and a call list. The man on the phone told him that he could leave it to him. But he shouldn't do anything out of the ordinary as they didn't want to make the situation worse. They had just started doing business in this country and Yao was the first one they sent. He must remember that they should not stick their neck out too much. In addition, the key investigation includes the death of another person number four in country N, where their help is needed even more. An hour later, Anderson, sitting at the computer, said that he had found something. Before his death, he often communicated with a woman named Yang Zaioi, and she was also one of the last people he saw before he died. She is very beautiful and has a husband. The man asked him what he wanted to say. They are an ordinary married couple, and they could not kill him. He must return in three days, and if he doesn't find anything, then they need him here. The next day at Sun Keek's house. She was riding a bicycle with a Nuo, who suddenly stopped, brought her to the entrance, and asked, touching her head, why her temperature had suddenly risen. She replied that the radiator at home was broken, and she had caught a cold last night. She became embarrassed when he hugged her and said that her parents were most likely not at home. He thought that after the debt collection turmoil at school, he had taken sick leave, and now he had found a friend who would lend him money. Nuo led the keek straight to the apartment when he suddenly stopped and silently looked into the distance. He realized that someone was at home. He sat the keek down on a chair and continued thinking that someone had dared to enter someone else's house in broad daylight. And it's very close. Keek frowned and closed her eyes when suddenly Nuo asked her not to sleep and asked where the medicine was at home. She needs to drink this first. She asked him again in surprise what? The medicine is in the team's box in her parents' room. When he opened the doors, he wondered if the guy had really disappeared. This is a capable person. He started looking for medicine in the chest of drawers and Anderson was right behind him. Thinking that his muscles were relaxed, there was no protection and this was an ordinary person. Nuo searched and thought that he was just a master and a foreigner. This is no ordinary thief. He found the medicines he needed, grabbed the pack and stood up abruptly, when suddenly Anderson jumped straight to the ceiling and grabbed the walls with special sharp tools and imperceptibly hung over the head of the Nuo, who went out into the doorway and slammed the doors, after which he approached the Keek, who held her head with her hand and told her to take the medicine. He realized that this guy had left, after which he touched Cake's hair and told her to sleep. She blushed and told him she didn't want it, but a moment later she fell asleep on the couch. Nuo covered her with a blanket and blocked out the bright light from the window, realizing that this guy had left through the window. He looked out the window and immediately jumped out. After some time in the office, Anderson posted photographs of everyone involved in the case and wondered if this was an accident. Nuo watched what was happening through the window. Anderson suspected something was wrong and turned around sharply, but did not see anyone. Some more time passed and Nuo found himself in a cafe, where he asked the waiter to give him rice, noodles with meat, 
and also add a boiled egg. The man asked him to wait a little. Nuo peeled the garlic and said, it turned out to be Anderson from the Abyss organization. Maybe he should bury him? He already did this in his previous life. Abyss is a Class B organization created 50 years ago. There are several powerful people in the organization who have done many terrible things. This is the doctor, Cheetah Anderson. Among them, the most influential is the leader, nicknamed the Captain, who has incredible abilities. In addition, in an organization called Gold Digger, there are those who travel the world, create social networks, and make money from other organizations. In 2004, Chen Nuo destroys the Abyss in Rage because they blackmailed him. Because of this, he received the name Yan Luo, which means Lord of Hell. This time, the Abyss provoked him again. He sat and said, well, no. If something happens to Anderson, the Song family will definitely suffer, and they will be destroyed again. He is tired of returning to that dark world, and in this life, he wants to change. He will not touch those who do not touch him, and since the Song name has been crossed out, then Anderson, life is long. The next day he came to school, and one of his classmates threw him a basketball and shouted his name. He caught it, another guy ran up to him and said that he was an Olaf, and no one could stop him on the way to his dream. Nuo jumped up and said, throwing the ball into the hoop, that he was just showing off. He was able to score a goal, and the surrounding girls exclaimed with joy and began shouting that he was simply invincible. He was incredibly handsome. Among the girls, standing in incredible embarrassment, was Cake, who silently looked at him with a reddened face and reflected on how handsome he was. He approached her, and she handed him a thermos with a hot drink. He took the mug in his hands and thought that he wasn't old enough to drink a drink with Wolfberry. She grabbed his hand and said that her dad said that after training you should not drink cold water and that health problems may appear in old age. He also said that wolfberries are good for the kidneys. Suddenly, someone shouted Chen Nuo's name and someone drank Almighty and he will achieve whatever he wants. There was a crowd of guys in front of him and one of them said that they were too noisy and made him angry. Nuo asked who he was. One of his guys said that his name is Zhongling Sheng, and he is the head of a gang in the Causeway Bay Area, and he is also their friend. Nuo asked a question, that is, the brother he has long admired here. This is great. Lin Sheng told him that he would beat him to death, and even God would not help him. He should hold on. Suddenly, an appearing in Guan jumped on him, who decided to protect him and said looking straight into his eyes, she finally found him, and he was safe. Lin Sheng dropped the chain and thought, how terrible. Another schoolgirl ruined everything. Nuo didn't expect to see her here and wondered what she was doing here. Cake also sadly asked herself mentally, is she really superfluous here? Inguan continued to hug him while Nuo wondered how she ended up here and escaped from that battlefield. Maybe he should tell her that he has a Gemini brother or call Cake for help. In no case, this is too humiliating. He looked at the Lingsheng waiting for him and thought, okay, now he will show him. Yingwen jumped away from him sharply when bright sparks began to emanate from his body and Ling Sheng looked at him in surprise and Nuo began to shout loudly, Senior year is such a good time and he does such things. He thinks he needs to be taught a lesson. Today he will take his place and let him know that sooner or later you have to pay for everything. He suddenly began to run towards him and Ling Sheng was dumbfounded and a moment later Nuo hit him right between the legs with her knee, causing Ling Sheng to fall to the ground and scream loudly in pain. Nuo came close to his ear and whispered to let him quickly take him to the hospital, otherwise he would definitely take his place. Lin Sheng screamed with tears in his eyes to quickly take him to the hospital as he was feeling terrible. Keek and Yingwen began to run towards him and shout to him, but he grabbed Lin Sheng in his arms and his friends wondered in bewilderment, had the boss been defeated in a second? Was he just taken away? Another said that he saw it too. What a ruthless person Chen Nuo is. The girls ran in different directions and tried to find him near the stone wall. Inguan screamed, where did he run away? Suddenly he grabbed her from behind and covered her mouth as she tried to scream in fear. He silenced her, then reached out with his hand and asked how she was feeling. She suddenly screamed loudly at him, buddy, and reached out to hug him. He stopped her with his hand and asked her not to move. She waved her arms, continuing to approach him, but Nuo asked him to stop calling him that, because in this way she was only causing trouble. First she should tell her why she was looking for him. She replied, snapping her fingers, that she remembered the Chinese inscription on his coat, and her mother translated it here. She was in the principal's office and passing through the reception area when she suddenly became embarrassed and screamed, buddy, and then she heard a noise and saw him. 
Nuo grabbed his head and said, What a horror. This is already crossing all boundaries. She doesn't want to cause him any trouble, does she? She became embarrassed and replied, Of course not. He said that in this case, he would establish some rules that she must follow. She replied with a satisfied expression that she would obey him. He straightened his finger and said, Okay, first, no one should know that he once saved her family, because he understood that she was the only one who knew his true identity, and secondly, he needed to come up with a story about that how they met. Thirdly, he cannot stand out in public, so she must learn Chinese well. That's all he came up with for now, and if anything happens, he'll contact her later. She looked after him in surprise and asked again, Is he leaving already? He answered without turning around, Yes, and thought, There are still those who are pursuing them, and we can't leave it like that. Meanwhile, Cake was squatting and remembering this terrible event when Ingwan hugged Nuo and was sad why he was doing this to her. Tears appeared in her eyes and suddenly in front of her face, someone extended his hand to her with a napkin. It was Nuo who asked why she was crying. She turned around and asked him again, snatching the napkin with anger, why did she hug him? He replied that when a person does not know what is the best answer to a girl, then there is no need to answer at all, because he will still answer incorrectly and he needs to think differently. He asked again, is she crying just because of this? Cake again asked the question, does he know her? He replied that she was his friend and Cake immediately asked how they knew each other. He decided to change the subject and asked again, did she see anyone else when she ran out? She replied, no, she just ran after him. When she got up, she just touched her knee and asked again, what happened to that girl? Didn't she run after him? She was running ahead of her. Nuo spread his hands and said that he didn't know where she was. Maybe she ran away. Cake got angry again and asked a direct question, what is his relationship with this girl? He thought about it, she is so stubborn and cannot be ignored. Suddenly, teacher and ran up to them and said, Chen Nuo, Cake, he was able to find them. They are all right. They should go back with him because the director is going crazy. The guys looked at him in surprise. Meanwhile, in the schoolyard, Principal Fan was shouting at the students who were squatting in front of him, what was wrong with them? Are they going to become bandits? Do they want to break the law and commit crimes? Why do they need these murders and fights? They shouldn't take knives and guns. He's disappointed in them. Anne told the director that he had found them. Fan turned around and thought, this child again. He hadn't forgotten about the Yanbin incident. He started screaming, what happened? Nuo said that they tried to beat him, and he ran away because he could not defeat them. Fan continued to shout, why don't they hit others, just him? He provokes them himself, and then tries to justify himself. Nuo grinned and replied that they were really making fun of him. Did he really have to endure such treatment? Fan was still screaming in rage. How was he talking to the director? Does he want the school staff to call his parents? He turned away and said that he could do this, to which the director shouted at him so that others would quickly look at this lawlessness. His parents should start raising him. After these words, and turned to Fan and told him that this guy's name is Chen Nuo and his parents are divorced. His father is in the United States and his mother is in prison. Cake looked after him and wondered if he was really leaving. He hasn't answered her yet. Nuo was very annoyed by what was happening. SK in Cake's house that night. He sat on the same sofa with Shandy, who told him that the third person had said it here and there was nothing wrong with it. He heard that a new student from Country N came to school. Do they know each other? It was painful for Keek to hear this, and she was dumbfounded, and Nuo thought that her eyes were swollen, and she must have been crying at home, and she was interrogated. He replied that it was just a coincidence. Just two days ago, he was learning how to repair cars at his friend Daly's workshop, and this girl nearby happened to have a broken car, so he fixed it. He asked again, is she a foreigner and a young girl, and walks the streets alone? Nuo replied, of course not, she was with an adult, but it was difficult to understand her. Shanley asked a question, he doesn't understand, they met once, and she was already so delighted with him. He said that it was probably because he was very handsome. Shanley thought about it, he is really handsome. Cake said that the girl from Country N is also beautiful, and they are both at that age that this is normal, but he thinks that they chatted a lot today, and it's time to go home. Then since everything is in order, he returns first. Keek said that she would see him off, and followed him up the stairs in silence. When he left the apartment, he said that everything was fine, and she could come back. She hugged him, and said that she had never hugged him like that girl during the day. He became wary, their eyes crossed, and embarrassment was visible on Cake's face. She immediately ran back home, and Nuo looked after her and thought how cute she was. 
After a while, Ling Ching was still sitting near the trash can. He grabbed his head and wondered who he was. Where is he and what is he doing here? In his head, there were the words of the song that he says whatever he wants people to respect him. He looked at his hands and shouted, That's right, he is Heonan's brother. Chen Nuo, he will take revenge on him. Someone straightened his hand, and suddenly a blow was struck on the guy's cheek. His father yelled at him. He didn't even dare to come back after doing such things. He dragged him straight along the ground, grabbed him by his clothes, and said that they would see how they took care of him today. Ling Xing pondered Chen Nuo. Their old grievances have not yet disappeared, and his father slapped him. It's all his fault. Meanwhile, the class teacher and acting director, Teacher Wu, taught the lesson and introduced Ying Wen as her classmate. She came from another school and will study with them. She greeted the guys, said her name again, and said that she was very glad to meet them. He asked her to sit down in the empty seat next to Chen Nuo in the last row. Keek began to be indignant and said, standing up sharply, teacher. The new classmate is a foreigner and her Chinese may not be very good, so she is afraid that she will not be able to understand the lecture while sitting in the last row. You can't even see the board on the last row. King turned to Nuo with a grin and told him to look at the battle that had begun. He should thank him when he turns around. Nuo covered his face with his hands and King spoke up, teacher. Let her sit in his place and he sit in the last row with Chen Nuo. The teacher replied, okay, they will do that. One of the guys who was opposite the Ingguan greeted her and wanted to tell her his name. But she told him to shut up, opened her pencil case, closed her hands, and thanked the Guan for his protection. This guy, who noticed what was happening, asked the others in surprise, did they see this? King touched his shoulder and asked him to respect the religious beliefs of foreigners.